meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council is called to order. Uh, let me ask if the clerk would be kind enough to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkin? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, we will begin today's meeting. We are initially going to be going into a closed litigation and personnel session. Uh, this would be the opportunity for anyone who wishes to address the council on those closed session matters before we recess and go to a closed session to make any comments you would wish to make. This is solely on the closed session litigation and personnel items. Seeing and hearing none, let me ask the clerk to, and I will be doing this rather than myself doing it, I'm going to ask the clerk from time to time to communicate with the public about how they can communicate with us. Ms. Bush? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for members of the public who are joining us um, virtually or streaming, now is the time for you to call or raise your hand to speak. You can press star nine or select the raise hand on your webinar controls and you'll hear an announcement when you are unmuted. Questions, comments? Seeing and hearing none, we will recess into closed session. I, I will say there are two people who have joined us virtually, so um, if I could, if either two attendees are wishing to speak on closed session, please press star nine to raise your hand. Seeing and hearing none, we stand in recess.
the hour of 2.15 having arrived and passed, we will come out of recess and close session and begin our afternoon session. Mr. Condotti, let me ask you if we have any reportable items out of the closed session. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members okay, of the City no, Council. Can I call roll really quick? Excuse me, call the roll. Uh, uh, Councilmember Newsom? Here. Brown? Here. Watkin? Here. Bruner? Present. Calentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Mr. Condotti? Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. The council met um, this afternoon at 12.30 in closed session in the Courtyard Conference Room to discuss the following uh, items. Item one was a conference with labor negotiators. Item one was a conference with labor negotiators involving the following bargaining groups. A police Officers Association, Police Management, SEIU Temporary Employees, and SEIU Service Employees. Item two was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. First item was a, uh, the matter entitled City of Santa Cruz versus Service Employees International Union, currently pending before the Public uh, employee, Employment um, Relations Board. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. Item two was uh, pending litigation in the third appellate district entitled Grant Park Neighborhood Association Advocates et al. versus California Department of Public Health et al. Uh, Council member uh, Golder has recused herself uh, from that item because she is a party. Uh, the remaining council members by a vote of five to one void voted to direct the city attorney's office to prepare an amicus brief in support of the plaintiffs and appellants in that case. Uh, Councilmember Brown was the, uh, the only no vote. Item three was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims. The claims of Cohen, Hian, Liam, Liberty Mutual Insurance, Robert Fleck, and Leanne N. Hunter uh, there was no action on those items, but they are also listed this afternoon on your consent calendar as item number 13. Item four was a public employee performance evaluation slash conference with labor negotiators. Council received a report from its designated uh, representative, yours truly. There was no reportable action. Thank you very much. Let me ask the city clerk if you would be kind enough to read into the record the way that folks can participate this afternoon and this evening. Thank you, Mayor. For those who um, are either called in or participating virtually, I have put the instructions on the screen. Um, now, um, you would call before your item. Please, um, you raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand um, option in your webinar controls. And I will flash the instructions every now and then for, for as a reminder. Thank you, Ms. Bush. We appreciate that. Let me ask if there are statements of disqualification that any member would like to or is required to make at this time on any matters on our agenda. Ms. Bruner. I have a statement of disqualification for item 24, 24.1 and 24.2. Out of an abundance of caution, these, these items are the downtown expansion area plan amendment revision, and which relates to my employment with the neighboring district of the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz. Thank you for that. Any Thank other you. member? Seeing and hearing none. Let me ask if there are additions and <coughs> deletions. Do we have any additions or deletions? Yes, Ms. we Bush. do have um, an addition of an item, and I will um, refer to Heidi Luckenbach from Water. I'm on my way. 
Yeah, we are adding a resolution to item six, I believe on your agenda that addresses um, procurement items related specifically to FEMA requirements. I'm happy to speak more of that when that agenda item comes up, if that's appropriate or no. Any other additions or deletions? Let me, uh, uh, Mayor, I will me. defer to the city attorney, but I think we need a vote. We need a motion and a vote on to add it. Yes, and we'll get there. We'll get ourselves there. Let me, uh, me in order to move ahead, let me make a couple of comments first. Uh, every member here has, uh, and the public, have observed the tremendous presidentially declared disaster that we have experienced. We've had our city manager declare a state of emergency and disaster. The governor, who is in our county at this moment, uh, touring some sites, uh, has made the state declaration and the President of the United States has issued the presidential proclamation. Uh, I had the good fortune yesterday of speaking, of receiving a call from the Vice President of the United States offering assistance to our community. Uh, any such help we may need, whether it's a federal emergency management agency or others, and she indicated that the administration stood ready to be of assistance to us and we appreciated that. I also want to say that uh, every worker in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, every worker recall, uh, excuse me, was called to duty during these past several days and especially during the cyclone bomb uh, that hit our community. And in order to respond adequately, all hands were on deck. And whether that is our police, fire, public works, water department, others, everyone responded with the kind of deep caring and humanity that we've come to know and expect out of our city workers, as well as our partners in local government, the county of Santa Cruz, uh, other cities in our community, as well as a number of nonprofits who stood up uh, as we know they always do. Um, what I'd like to be able to do at this point is, uh, is give other members, I know this is unusual, but it's an unusual circumstance. If any other members would like to make brief comments about that, uh, certainly we, you will be acknowledged. Anyone wish to do that? Ms. Brown. I would, uh, I just want to uh, put a fine point on the appreciation and recognition of our uh, city workers who uh, stepped in. I know that's happening with public agencies around the county, um, but they stepped in and uh, under very challenging circumstances uh, worked in, you know, in jobs that they're not familiar with and, um, and, and they've continued to do this during crisis. Um, I don't want to sound like we're in perpetual crisis, but you know, multiple crises. So um, I, I just want to say, you know, and, and the Parks and Rec crew, I know that you um, kind of just jumped in and were responsive immediately with the Civic and um, Ms. Bond, if you're out there listening, especially uh, uh, who coordinates that uh, this, that space. Um, thank you so much for being there, and um, we really do appreciate you, Mr. Newsom. I just want to, uh, uh, you know, just reiterate that as well, and just, you know, uh, state my thanks for the work that the uh, city workers did this past week uh, as a, as a storm came in, and uh, how they handled the situation, and how they stepped up, and uh, uh, how they addressed it. It was uh, uh, did a really great job. Thank you, Miss Watkins. Yeah, no, I'll just briefly also extend my gratitude and thanks. I think in these types of instances and these times in crises is when you see the best of people coming forward. And not only do you see our workers prepared and willing to go and serve and do what they can do in their capacity, but also just members of our community wanting to help in any way they can, helping with sandbagging or whatever it is that they can do. 
Um, you know, I grew up in the county, and I think the devastation is just, it's, it's unbearable to a certain extent, having been a child, being able to access a number of the places that have been destroyed. That being said, we're an incredible, resilient community, and we'll continue to do what we can to come together to support each other in these types of challenging circumstances, and do what we can to um, recover from here moving forward. So, um, yeah, kudos and extension of gratitude to the entire community for, for really rallying to support those in most in need at this time. Thank you. Ms. Bruner. Thank you for the opportunity. I would definitely like to thank um, Erica Smart, our new communications uh, director uh, with the city, who really uh, jumped on board and quickly was able to get information out to our community um, in English and Spanish in this time of crisis. I would like to thank our Parks and Rec crew for all of their work at the Civic Auditorium as the shelter and the freight depot uh, building at the freight building at Depot Park um, as another shelter and our um, free guide who operated that. Um, and our entire community who uh, came together in this time um, was remarkable. Thank you to the Community Foundation for providing a disaster relief fund for um, anybody who needs it and to the family who donated a matching amount of 75000 It's just an example of um, all of us working together in the most difficult time and um, as we enter into recovery mode and assessing damages, you know, the city, um, we have our wharf. I know that we have, um, um, we will be assessing those damages. We have damage on Westcliff Drive that will be assessed um, and um, other areas of um, flooding. And I'm so glad that we had no fatalities. Thank you to our police and fire and um, the emergency responder crews. I know there were several water rescues yesterday. So with today's high surf advisory, I would just like to remind everyone to stay away from the surf zones and um, the water. And um, thank you to everyone for the last week of work during a time when our city offices were closed, technically. Everyone did come together hands on deck. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bruner. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for the opportunity. My colleagues have um, made a lot of the same things that I would make, but certainly to city staff and Parks and Rec, it was amazing to see everyone come together and work through the holiday week. Um, the partnership with the county and, and county programs, I know that we've coordinated with their EOC um, and the nonprofits who were able to come and support the city or support any other locations that needed the support. Um, uh, Council Member Bruner mentioned Community Foundation, also Volunteer Center is all, um, still um, providing opportunity for folks who want to volunteer and help with the restoration of our community. Um, and thank you to City Manager Matt Huffaker for keeping us minute by minute up to date with what's happening and how we can contribute and support the efforts of the city. Thank you very much. Ms. Golder. I don't have... Um, Anybody in addition to thank other than I really do want to express my thanks to the staff who worked tirelessly in the months before this to clean up the bench lands because I think if that was part of the emergency, it, we could have seen a lot more loss of life. And so having um, the foresight to have that um, encampment cleaned up and those folks relocated, seeing that the, the river reached all-time highs um, was really um, a lot of a lot of work in advance of this that was also super helpful. So thank you to the workers who did that work. And thank you to everybody who came together in the community to help out those in need. And I'm just happy that everybody, for the most part, was you know safe and healthy. And um, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. What is the appropriate motion you're looking for, sir, here? I need to explain the basis for the motion. Um, Due to uh, threats to city facilities and infrastructure that came to the attention of city staff over the course of the weekend after the agenda was posted, and the need to take uh, urgent action to address the, the, the critical immediate ones, 
uh, a resolution has been prepared that authorizes emergency procurement of goods, uh, materials, and construction services uh, during the existence of the local emergency. Um, what this is intended to do is to give city staff the ability to move forward immediately for some pressing needs. There will be additional projects that come forward over, the, over time, but in order to make sure that we get started quickly and that we comply with uh, FEMA and other regulations uh, necessary to hopefully get reimbursed for the costs, um, this resolution is being added. Uh, the recommendation is to, um, is to remove item number seven from the consent calendar and consider this resolution in conjunction with the resolution that's in your packet for item number seven. And in order to add this as a matter of subsequent need, it requires a, um, a vote of five council members. Is there a motion? So moved to... Second. Motion by Ms. Watkins, a second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Debate or discussion? Seconded by Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm getting used to voices and uh, so on. <laughs> Not just the voices in my head, but the actual <laughs> voices. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bruner, for the second. Is there a debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom. And this is. Uh, this is to add. To add, aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. The item is added. Now, further on the, we are now on the consent agenda. Let me ask if there are additions and deletions in addition to the addition we just made. Any additions or deletions to the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to pull item number 14, item number um, 14. at the request of staff. Is that correct, Bonnie? I'm looking. Yeah. Item number 14 will be pulled, and that item will become item 21.1. Mm -hmm. No, it'll, it'll stay, still be 14. Excuse me? It'll still be 14. We don't renumber them when they get pulled. Oh, we don't? Mm -mm. Well, this is very different than the Board of Supervisors. All right, it'll remain, <laughs> but we will take it up uh, after item 21. Further on the consent agenda, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Uh, item 12. Item 12. It is, uh, it is pulled. Others? Did you need to have item seven pulled as well in order to have that added? Okay, I'd like to pull item seven. Item seven. Others? <clears throat> Others on the consent agenda? Anyone with us today who wants to pull an item off the consent agenda? Hmm? I'm sorry, to comment on the consent agenda, please do, please do. Um, would this be the moment to make a comment? Make a comment okay. on consent, Jen, sure. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Marin with the Hobby Foundation. Um, but I just want to comment on item number Can you please speak into the mic? The mic right yeah, thank you. I want to um, comment on item number 20, the Laguna Creek Diversion Retrofit Project. I live right next door to that project, and so I um, know it really well. I walk that part of the creek all the time. And um, I watched the work and especially the revegetation work. And I just want to share with you because I don't know who, who I should be telling this to, if anyone, but I'm just, just a word to the wise. Um, the revegetation work that has been done um, flies in the face of um, much of what, uh, how a forest grows, um, how trees should be planted in relationship to each other and to light. And um, so what's happened is that there are little um, groupings of redwoods and other plants that have been revegetated um, where they have very little chance of uh, growing. And uh, they have to be watered by water trucked in to Laguna Creek, right where Laguna Creek is. Now, I'm sure all of this is in some kind of compliance with some regulations. But 
Um, but the bottom line is that the owner of that property where this work has been done intends to pull all of that out in five years when the project is no longer uh, you know, required to, to be maintained. And um, so I'm just wanting to let you know that that seems like a, a terrible inefficiency, and maybe there's some way to intervene in those kinds of decisions and revegetation projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to comment on the consent agenda? Ms. Schendeldecker, good afternoon. Hi, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I just wanted to comment on item 11, mm -hmm. the, um, the grant application for San Lorenzo River flooding and climate change. Um, while I'm, I, I think it's great that we're, that you're looking for funding to keep pushing forward on um, climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, and I'm really glad to see that there's funding in there for um, RV dumping to match local enterprise grant uh, funds. I also just want to sort of flag that there's been 20 years plus of study of the San Lorenzo River planning. We have people active in our community who have been working on, um, you know, worked on the San Lorenzo River plan in 2003, and the recommendations for that were shelved. The copy of it that's available online is missing some pages, and there's, to me that points to two things. One, that the, the city hasn't taken seriously the work that it's done in past decades, hasn't taken advantage of local knowledge and um, resources, uh, person power that's been available to work on these, these items. And, and people are still on advisory body, bodies if you look up that document and see who was involved. So it just, I, I'd like to, like to recommend that everybody take a look at that river plan from 2003, take seriously the recommendations that were made then, which um, were informed by, I think, early knowledge, earlier knowledge of climate change, even if it's not mentioned specifically by that wording. Um, and, you know, take some of that advice along with spending, you know, 100,000, 200,000, however many more dollars for yet another study. Um, you know, we do a lot of studies. Let's do the work, too. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else who's wish it, with us today who wishes to comment on the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council, and uh, we're going to take up those items that were pulled. So let's take a look. <laughs> yes. Um, you want a you motion a on the remaining... To... Sorry, Mayor, you would do a vote to accept the full consent agenda um, calendar and then go to the ones that were pulled. Okay, let's get a motion on the remaining consent agenda items. Motion? Mayor? Yes? I had a comment on this earlier question. Maybe. Well, go ahead. Uh, so I have a comment on 15 finalizing sister city relationship between Biarritz, France, and the city of Santa Cruz. And I just wanted to say thank you to Parks and Rec, Tremaine Head and Jones, and City Attorney's Office, Cassie Bronson, um, for working on this finalization, which wasn't quite uh, ready by the end of the year. And so with this um, a new finalization, I'm looking forward to um, continuing a sister city relationship with Biarritz, France. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have another item you want to comment on? Question on 18 is the West Cliff Drive Walking Path Storm Damage Repair Project completion. I was just curious if any of the storm, recent storm impacts um, along West Cliff Drive are associated or impacted this project at all. Mayor Keeley, a member of the City Council. My name is You're Joshua Spangrud. I'm sorry? You are recognized. Thank you. Um, so the this notice of completion for uh, Westcliff is actually the last FEMA project from the last declared declaration in 2017. It held up fine. It is not part of the damage uh, that's currently going on in Westcliff. Thank you. For the question or comment, anyone else? As a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as amended. Those in oh, do we, favor. Do we have a motion already? 
Council Member Brunner, I make a motion yeah. to approve the council the consent agenda. Did we have a motion on the floor? Yeah, I have Council Member Watkins seconded oh. by Council yeah. Member Brunner. Okay, that's yeah. where I thought we were. Okay, <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Um, Brunner. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes. And so ordered. Uh, we're going to go to item 14, which was pulled. The member who pulled that item wish to open on it? Sure. This item was pulled on request of staff, and I'll go ahead and have our staff to speak to it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Um, on June, I'm Elizabeth Cabell, Finance you. Director. Sorry. Thank you. On June 28th of last year, staff brought an item to Council discussing the implementation of energy-related improvements at three city sites, the Civic Auditorium, SoCal Front Garage, and Harvey West Ball Park Ball Field. At that meeting, Council adopted a resolution authorizing execution of an agreement with SiteLogic for the implementation of the improvements with funding provided by a low-interest California Energy Commission loan of $3 million and a tax-exempt municipal lease loan of $3.5 million. The CEC loan was approved in October for $2.4 million instead of the expected $3 million, so the municipal lease loan that, that's brought before you today is for $3.8 million instead of $3.5 million. The scope of work and total cost of the project has not changed from what was approved in June, but because the municipal lease loan amount is different than what was originally approved, we need to have the item considered and voted on as a separate item of business and not part of the consent calendar. So staff, municipal advisors, bond council, um, and site logic are all here if you have any questions on anything. Members' questions? Thank you very much. We're going to take these one at a time. Is there a motion to accept item 14 as recommended? I'll make a motion. We need um, public comment. Oh. Public comment? Seeing, hearing none. I'll move item 14. A second. Motion and a second. Under discussion, seeing and hearing none, we will move to a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Item 12 on the consent agenda. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. <coughs> Thank you. This is um, the committees and commissions for council members. And I wanted to request um, that um, I serve on the Downtown Management Corporation and I've spoken to council member Brown about um, swapping places there. We're good? Yes. We're good, good. Further on this item, I do. Ms. Watkins? Yes, I apologize for not speaking to you in advance of that. I saw that I was removed from the Farmer's Market Board and I know that the Farmer's Market Board likes to be consulted prior to any kind of changes at the city level. So I'd like to either request to remain and or have that conversation with the board prior to making this change. Okay, uh, why don't we, why don't we, uh, go ahead, you had a comment, Ms. Bruner? And I'd like to recommend that uh, Council Member Watkins remain on the Farmer's Market Board. And on, and would that mean that somebody needs to, who was indicated to be on here? Myself. And are you okay? You're okay with that? Dropping okay. off Thanks. that? Correct. Okay. Further? Nope. Uh, Thank you. And I would like to apologize to my friend, Ms. Brown, who, in my putting together of all of these uh, requests, uh, I, uh, I made a, an error. No matter how many times I read it, I, I didn't see the error every time. And uh, Ms. Brown is going to be our representative to the Regional Transportation Commission. I will be, if the council approves this, the alternate on the Regional Transportation Commission. I would like that without objection inserted into this item. Are there further questions or comments on this item? Anyone on the public wish to make comment on this? I'm sorry, Mr. Newsom. Uh, quick question. I've, uh, or I'm just noticing that for the Integrated Waste Management Local Task Force, I am listed twice as on the council or on the agency and as an alternate. That's uh, so is that good. correct? <laughs> <laughs> We're expecting so Let's make sure that's correct. I've already fixed it. That was the original, but I've updated the, the document. 
That's what we do to the new council members. <laughs> double, double and triple them up on things. All right, uh, those, those changes are made. Uh, anyone wish to comment on this item on appointments? Seeing and hearing none, a roll call vote's in order. Do we have a motion? No, it's a, yeah, there's a motion, a second. Contar Johnson seconded by Watkins. Roll call vote, please. Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Shalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Council, uh, we are on agenda item number seven. I don't know. And well, Ms. Watkins, did you I pulled wish this. to comment on this? Well, I just wanted to see if there was any further discussion, but we did hear from our city attorney and um, the logic you know, behind this, so I'm happy to just proceed in moving it after we have public comment, if you'd like. All right, public comments on this matter? Seeing and hearing none, motion to approve is in order. I'll go ahead and move it. Motion with, by um, Ms. Watkins, second by Mr. Newsom. Is there public comment? Seeing and hearing none, we will move, or excuse me, debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Pardon me, Mayor. Just for clarity, um, the motion is to adopt the two resolutions, mm -hmm. the revised resolution for item seven that was distributed to the council, as well as the additional resolution that has been prepared for the emergency procurement. The record will reflect that's the motion. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cleary? Aye. Members, we have, uh, we're now moving ourselves to the item that uh, does require a, uh, a public hearing on our consent item number 21. That item is now before us. Let me, uh, ask first if there are any questions or comments on this item by members. Seeing and hearing none, we will go to the public. We're in a public hearing at this point regarding item 21, a second reading and final adoption of an ordinance relating to the fire code. Anyone wish to make comment on that? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council and a motion to approve would be in order. Council member Brunner, I, I make a motion to Ms. Ms. Brunner, Ms. Watkins is a second. Debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none. Roll call vote. Please. Member Newsom. What, what are we voting on? Um, the second reading of the- uh, Aye. Uh, Brown. Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes. We are on item 22 on our agenda this afternoon. This is Health and All Policies Progress Report and work plan, who will be presenting on this issue? That will be me, Mayor. I am Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. You're welcome. Let me uh, bring this up, please, this presentation. <coughs> and may I ask the clerk, I need to both share the screen and turn on the camera, is that correct? Thank you. 
All right, here we are. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. As I mentioned, I'm Tiffany Weisbus, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the city. And I am here to share with you today the progress uh, on health and all policies over 2022 and the 2023 work plan. I want to start by acknowledging uh, the council members that um, are on the uh, Health and All Policy City Council Committee, uh, Council Member Watkins, Kalantari Johnson, and Bruner. And I also want to acknowledge uh, our consultant, uh, Nicole Young of Optimal Solutions, who's really assisted us with carrying out these work plans uh, over the years. So just to jump right into it, um, what is Health and All Policies and you know, why is this an initiative here at the city? So Health and All Policies really is an acknowledgement that local government decisions and policy making impacts community well-being. And in turn, evidence demonstrates that prioritizing equity, public health, and sustainability results in improved community well-being. Um, this initiative uh, started back in 2018, motivated by then Mayor Martine Watkins, um, and really uh, acknowledging that no one sector or agency alone can do this, uh, improve community well-being, that it takes a cross-sectoral approach that yields uh, multiple benefits for our community. This initiative is aligned with the core conditions of community well-being, where core stands for collective results of evidence-based investments, which is a funding model uh, partnership between the county and the city to achieve equitable health and well-being in the county. Um, also, there is broader support for health and all policies. It is an international framework utilized by the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States. Uh, the state of California has three cabinet level positions in the Strategic Growth Council, and there are a number of US and neighboring uh, local governments that utilize this framework, notably the cities of Richmond, Gonzales, and Monterey County. However, each of these jurisdictions really operationalizes this framework in a different way. And I want to share with you how the city has operationalized this framework um, by sharing some of the highlights. I'm not going to read all the words on the screen here, but I will say that um, there was a city council and um, city uh, department head committee that, that was directed in 2018 to evaluate how would the city operationalize health and all policies here at the city. That resulted in um, an ordinance as well as implementation recommendations, lots of training that's happened over the last several years. Um, we do uh, include uh, narrative language on how health and all policies has been incorporated in every item on agenda reports. And subsequently, in 2021, a, um, a resolution on race, racial discrimination uh, was also adopted that was very complimentary that actually reconvened the Health and All Policies um, City Council Committee this past year. We do have a set of community well-being metrics that were adopted that are aligned with the core conditions of well-being. Um, this past year, we integrated health and all policies into the budget, and that's a phased approach that's ongoing, and began our work as a result of the racial discrimination resolution, looking at diversity in recruitment and representation on our committees and commissions. This next year, as you've seen in your agenda report, there are some other items related to single-use tobacco waste product options. Um, as well as carrying uh, some ongoing work with the, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee and a diversity, equity, and inclusion effort. So while we do track um, our indicator metrics, I think it's important to acknowledge that systemic change and improvements um, to community well-being over time do require sustained effort over years. And oftentimes, we do not see shifts and improvements until the decadal scale. So something I wanted to point out. One of the major work plan items um, over last year that will be continuing in an implementation phase this year, again, coming out of the racial discrimination resolution is, I'm so sorry. I have my ring on. Um, is a Santa Cruz like me uh, value of representation, representational uh, government uh, report and study that was conducted. Santa Cruz Like Me it was originally a partnership uh, between Santa Cruz Ventures 
and Santa Cruz County to understand what were the demographics of Santa Cruz County's um, and now the city's representative bodies and really acknowledge that different lived experience can help inform and shape policy and governance to ensure our county is resilient, resilient, prosperous, and equitable. I wanna acknowledge Maria Cadenas and Kayla Gomez from Ventures. I'm not sure if they're here, um, but they conducted our survey of all of our commissioners and committee members where we had 63% response rate, which is very high. So we know that um, the findings that we have um, are representative of our committees and commissions. Um, we surveyed folks on everything from gender, age, income, veteran status, education, identification as differently abled, race, ethnicity, and housing status. Um, and then we compare the results of those demographics with the citywide demographics. Um, the report also includes the county values for both of those as well. The findings that we, there were several critical findings. One is that there is critical overrepresentation of zip code 95060, considered the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, a higher that has higher income households. There's no representation of young adults and low representation of those without higher education degrees and households under $100,000 uh, a year. There's also critical underrepresentation of people of color and renters. So with that, the Santa Cruz uh, Like Me, a City Like Me report that you see here uh, came out with some recommendations, which the city uh, will be carrying out over this next year, and I'm going to share those with you right now as well. Uh, number one, we will be forming a diverse and inclusive external advisory body, the Health and All Policies Committee, to guide the recommendation, the implementation of these recommendations, gaining input on targets for diversity, potentially compensation, and outreach to diverse peoples. Number two, more training. That's something that always arises. Um, so in this case, training for our committee and commission staff and chairpersons on the purpose of why are we looking at demographics and why are we trying to diversify um, our advisory bodies. Um, we also be touching upon interpretation and translation, health and all policies itself, um, and uh, getting input on some of these efforts. Number three, um, I'll be working with the city clerk, Bonnie Bush, on um, recruitment diversity, translation and interpretation um, standards, um, as well as targets. Um, one other piece of this was that um, we were to brief the mayor and council on the city demographics and the purpose of this, which I am doing here today. Number four, uh, as I mentioned, we were, are going to be evaluating setting standards for interpretation and translation uh, beyond what we have in place now, which is on request. Um, and we have a guidance document on that, as well as targets for diversity in commissions and committees. Um, and then lastly, we're going to be working with the county to review the variances in our demographics, conduct knowledge sharing, share target setting approaches and work plans, and identify possible opportunities for collaboration. I think um, the uh, Commission on Latino Affairs at the county, um, I believe, was the lead on conducting their Santa Cruz Like Me report, and I think there are big possibilities there, as well as in the Human Services Commission and the Women's Commission. We also could potentially invite Monterey County to inform this, seeing as they've had health and all policies in place for some time. With that, uh, that is my report to you, and the recommendation is a motion to accept the 2022 progress report and approve the 2023 uh, work plan as presented and as contained in your agenda report. Ms. Wise West, thank you very much for your presentation today. Let me ask if council members have questions or comments on this item. Ms. Watkins. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I just want to thank my colleagues for their interest, their work, and um, but also really want to give my sincere gratitude to you, Tiffany, for all your dedication and hard work. I know this is one of many things on your plate, um, but I have heard over and over again that diversity, equity, inclusion, sustainability, and health and well-being is a priority for our community, and these values are ones that I too hold very um, close. And 
What I think I feel really is the power of health in all policies is the fact that this operationalizes those values in a way that we can see, as you said, though, in the long term, really, some change. And so um, I know that's a slow-moving process, but it's a critical process to really achieve some of the equity goals as well as some of the sustainability and health goals. I would like to see Monterey County come. I'd love to see how other jurisdictions have operationalized it. I think we can learn from them, and I'm sure that they can learn from some of the work we've done. Um, I know that in the report we had areas in which we want to see growth in. Um, and then actually it does get me to a question, if, if I may. I, want, I know that there was some funding, and I, I've mentioned this to you also, um, city, city Manager Matt, that you know having some sustained investment in this also matters. So I know that there was funding for 20,000. Do you feel that's going to adequately be able to meet the needs that we could see this potentially moving forward to address? I do for this next uh, year and the work plan. The work plan was kind of tailored around what can we manage in terms okay. of fiscally and um, with our capacity. So I do think that that can cover uh, what we need to accomplish this next year. I guess also then in, as a follow-up is I know that this has also been a place where there's additional items added to that. So if that were the case, such as the tobacco-related research that we'll be doing, um, you know, I think that we revisit the funding associated with that as opposed to additional workflow or workload so that you can have it manageable but also be able to, uh, you know, achieve some of our goals. Thank, Thank you, Tiffany. If, my, if I may chime in just really quickly, sure. Mayor, um, appreciate that comment, Councilmember uh, Watkins, and we are certainly sensitive to the number of priorities and um, additional projects we've added under the health and all policies umbrella. So we, we do look forward to working through that with the council as part of the strategic plan process and certainly looking at opportunities for us to con continue building out and I think achieving the vision that we've, we've set forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watkins. I think if, uh, if then, if at the strategic planning process and outcome, if it does look like that this is going to be integrated in more of an intensive way, that we have this item come back for further discussion and modification for potential additional funding supports. That would be a sort of informal request. Happy to do that. I would also anticipate part of that will occur in the course of uh, building out the budget for fiscal year 24 as well. Uh, and so uh, more conversations to come. Thank you. Council Member Bruner. Thank you. Uh, I just a brief comment to um, acknowledge Tiffany Wise West for all the work that um, on this uh, body we've really we set forth with some direction and to see it laid out in this report is really significant of what we've been able to address and um, I'm so glad you mentioned Nicole Young of Optimal Solutions and Maria Cadenas, Executive Director of Santa Cruz Ventures for the uh, a Santa Cruz Like Me report, um, because with that data, it was so eye-opening, and it's continuing to help inform our work going forward. So I'm happy to see our work uh, continue, and um, I'm happy to continue working on improving the equity and uh, well-being of our internal systems and externally in the city. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Ms. Kantari Johnson. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues on this committee and Tiffany for your leadership and um, for taking some big ideas and making it really concrete and succinct. Um, I'm excited to see the recommendation, uh, all of them, but certainly the recommendation of collaborating with the county and our committees and commissions. I mean, this is where we cultivate and develop um, leadership pipelines and, and that's what informs us as a uh, decision-making body. Um, there's also, hopefully, in that partnership, there's opportunity for us to talk about health and all policies in a, in a bigger way with the county. Um, you know, they have human services department, um, health services agency, the OR3, so there's a, there's a lot that we can do, and, and hopefully when inviting Monterey, um, it'll inspire us as a county to do bigger, bigger things with health and all policy outside of our city. Um, I really um, want to thank you, Council Member Watkins, for bringing up what it takes, the resources it takes to do this work. We've done a lot um, with the resources that we have, and I know that we could probably do a lot more. Because health and all policies, we have these very specific actions that we do, but it is bigger than the specific actions. It's infused in how we conduct our business. So thank you for your work, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Brown. Well, I'll also uh, add my sincere appreciation to Tiffany Wise West. It's amazing how you keep 
all of the balls in the air and bring uh, deliver us uh, really, really cohesive packages of information that are very useful for us. And so on that note, I want to just uh, make a comment for the general public, if you're listening, um, the report attached to this item is, is so useful. I mean, I loved seeing it, uh, City Like Me report. Um, you can find it there uh, attached to the agenda item, and I'm hoping we can get it up somewhere that it's more accessible for folks to find it on our website, um, because I know that we all express uh, and, and work towards uh, inclusive representation, and we talk about community engagement and wanting the public to really be involved in uh, city decision making, um, you know, new ideas, generating new ideas, all of those things. And uh, this shows where we're at, and it, it also, pro I think, provides uh, some motivation to get involved. As I was reading it, I thought, I want to I get involved in this. This is a cool thing. So, um, so thank you, and I hope that uh, folks out there will take a look at it, and um, happy to support moving forward um, with the, the process. Thank you. Further questions, comments? Anyone with us today who would like to make a comment on this item. This would be your opportunity to do so. We also have a couple people um, virtually with their hands. Good. Mr. Whitehead, come on up. Good afternoon, sir. Do you think that's who I am? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm Richard. Richard, of course you are. I would just say that for a long time, health doesn't start in the hospital. It starts in the neighborhood. So I don't know you, but I sure, coming here, didn't plan to talk. But if we're ever going to see change, I'm going to get your card, and I'm going to read the report. Uh, I can't be back here, but I'll be watching at 5 o'clock. And I came because I just wanted to welcome you, Fred, because I believe in for the next four years, we're going to see the power of what we can do in a neighborhood. Whether that's a neighborhood that I'd like to see on one block or what comes out of your plan, it's obvious this was fantastic. It didn't happen because I sure remember the county office and way back to your dad, so those who don't know me, I am a stand for change, 84 year young. But without going into all the details, if ever we're going to see change, it's to get to Cabrillo, it's to get to UC, to bring that voice forward. And I know I've got advocates for youth power. I've got advocates for a youth mayor because we've got to create a healthy Santa Cruz, starting with the families. And at least that one block where the warming center's getting out of there, we've got people paying the 2,500 for a one bedroom apartment. So I will get your card. Uh, what I represent is strategies. And they're based on that Cabrillo, but I would recommend that you get to the Latino Affairs Commission and they meet every other month and make this known to them. We have two representatives from the city of Santa Cruz. So, you know, Fred, President Obama, Michelle got started as a community organizer. Look who's sitting around. But let's not forget those who went before us. So with that, thank you for tying me. I, I love Nicholas. But you are Richard Lewis. I am That's aware of that. That's who I am. And, I, I, again, and, I, and again, by the way, you. my brother's back in Brazil. As those of you who don't know that last name, my brother Bob and Jack own Lewis Volkswagen. I'm proud of that. But I'm more proud of what this city manager can do back over in Watsonville. Because I said a prayer back 50 years ago with Father Rojas. A prayer I'm still hanging on to. So thank you for letting me. Remember, let's involve our here. Mr. Lewis, thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to provide comment? Ms. Bush, there are folks on 
line who would like to make comments. Yes, thank you. Uh, the thrust of both the summary and report you're being asked to accept contain the classic leftist and high up discrimination garbage. It seems this ventures organization wrote the report and as far as I know, it's a political action group that seeks to install more Hispanic people into positions of authority at any cost, led by two-time progressive political loser Maria Caldenas. Caldenas as a goal in itself, believing no one else can represent that community unless they have their ethnicity or skin color, never mind the qualifications, the skill, or the other views of other potential representatives. It is clearly favoring a discrimination and assignment of unearned privilege. The documents assume that there is something wrong with representation by people who have higher income or live in owned property or are well educated or are too white or could be more qualified when the composition or legislative or advisory bodies do not precisely match the many selected demographics or some of uh, some community which they define as zip code 95060 which is not in itself the city of Santa Cruz although using even the city of Santa Cruz doesn't make any more sense if you care about excellence, the people of Santa Cruz, or how well the city functions for its people instead of the summary and reports irrelevant factors. Further, uh, the false assumption presented as fact is that these disparities of demographics and representation must be due to the oppression of some pervasive white supremacy and no other, for example, superior candidate qualifications or voter wisdom. Their solution to this so-called problem is racial and other demographic quotas. In reality, for thousands of reasons, people are and will always be different and not exactly equal except in their basic rights. And the best we can do is assure equal opportunity to all to find life, liberty, and happiness with respect for all other individual rights. Before I go further, I would mention this summary and report is then an offensive, hypocritical, anti-racist, racist abomination. I would identify Tiffany Wise West and Martine Watkins as primary and motivated instigator actors of this defective ideology, and I request motion for their removal from the HIOP subcommittee and eventual repeal or rewrite of the HIOP policy in its entirety with apology by the council to prevent this kind of trash ideological abuse from being brought forward. It can only lead to mediocrity at best. I have read for years now the applications for commissioners and a good many, I'd say, were sloppily written in pencil and show no particular experience or knowledge and sometimes make application to numerous commissioner openings as if it makes no difference as long as they get an assignment. It matters who our representative and advisors are and the city has no need for reports filled with leftist false assumptions, false problem causes, and inane brain dead suggested corrective methods to those uh, or the supposed benefit from the people who believe and promote such things. Don't be telling anyone they have the wrong color skin. Don't tell anyone they're too educated or tell anyone they have achieved too much and that they can't represent other people. Thanks. Mr. Phillips, thank you very much. And who is our next uh, participant, Ms. Bush? Um, we have Kayla Gomez. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, is everyone able to hear me? Yes. Um, Ventures partners with rural Latino working class families in the Central Coast to build a prosperous and economic future for all, where zip code, race, gender, nor immigration status do not dictate income or wealth. I would really like to thank the Health and All Policies Committee for your partnership and especially Tiffany for your facilitation and your consistent support as we work to put this together, this report. I'm really pleased with the participation rate and as more cities begin to conduct this process, it's my hope that it will only increase. I also wanted to share that this report um, and the county level report we published in 2020 are both available on Ventures website, um, sccvonline.org. And we will also be hosting an open webinar in February to take a closer look into the report where we'll go through each piece of a Santa Cruz uh, city like me and we'll have a Q&A. And we'll also be sharing information and details for how to join on our website and through our social media. Uh, again, thank you so much for everyone who participated in this process and special thanks again to Tiffany and the Health and All Policies Committee uh, for your work. I do hope that this process will be replicated through the Central Coast. Uh, thank you so much. 
Ms. Gomez, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, does that complete our folks who are calling in from outside? It does. Thank you. Ms. Watkins. Yeah, I'm happy to move the recommendation, which is a motion to accept the Health and All Policies 2022 Progress Report and approve the proposed 2023 work plan. Motion by Ms. Watkins. Uh, second. Second by Ms. Bruner and Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Uh, <laughs> simultaneously wanted to make that second. Uh, further debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, we will move to a roll call vote. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Members, we are on item number 23. This is an item brought forward by, or brought to you by uh, Council Member Newsom and myself. This uh, matter relates to the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project and uh, related activities. Uh, what we will do is I'll make some opening remarks if Mr. Newsom or other members which wish to make remarks, such will be the case, then we will seek input from the public, both in person and online. Uh, the issue here from the perspective of myself and Mr. Newsom is that uh, we are new to this. Uh, we're both quite interested in, in the project. Uh, there was a matter before the Parks and Recreation Commission on this issue, an appeal, and uh, the, uh, without respect to how the Commission dealt with this issue, it is uh, my opinion, Mr. Newsom can speak for himself and suspect will, uh, is that it would be helpful to have these matters brought together when the uh, larger set of issues are in front of this council for consideration. So that is why we have brought this forward uh, and uh, the, the action that uh, we would appreciate uh, you taking after we've received some input. Mr. Newsom, do you wish to make any opening remarks, sir? Uh, no, I do not. Thank you, uh, summed up. Thank you. Let me ask if other members have questions or comments before we hear from the public. Let me invite the public to make uh, any comments you have. Let's start with the folks who are here. Anyone who is with us in chambers today wish to make a comment. It looks like we've got, uh, we've got a couple of folks who will do that. Uh, if you don't mind, what we will do is let's hear from you. And then what we'll do is hear from someone who's online, then we'll hear from someone who's here, and we'll alternate back and forth. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thanks for the time. Um, my name is Lisa Ekstrom. Please vote to approve this request from Mayor Keeley and Council Member Newsom to reconsider the Park and Recreation Commission's denial of an appeal on December 12th. It's clear that our heritage tree ordinance is designed to incorporate a heritage tree prior to a final project design. It's also clear that this consideration was not included in the design process for the project for lot four, except as an afterthought. To paraphrase Joni Mitchell, don't it always seem to go that we don't know what we've got till it's gone. We can and should save some of these heritage trees that we can. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Ms. Bush, would you ask one of our folks online to come forward? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Farrell. I'm here today uh, representing Downtown Forward, and we want to thank Mayor Keeley and Council Member Newsom for combining both these issues for a single consideration by the council. And I also, um, in following the lead of council who has been thanking city staff for all the great work they've done, I wanna uh, thank Leslie Keedy for the work she did in reviewing the heritage tree permit 
ordinance requirements around this particular project and say that I have had the opportunity to work with Leslie for over uh, 20 years and I find her to be uh, a consummate professional and a true advocate for the preservation of our urban forest. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon again, Mayor Keeley and council members. Um, well, I'm, I'm here to talk about trees, um, but I barely got here from Bonnie Dune today on account of so many, many trees being down, nine of them on Smith Grade, my road. And um, it really made me appreciate the trees that are still standing. Um, I'm grateful that this uh, item is on the agenda today, and I hope the council will uh, take a step back and clarify the process it needs to employ to move forward uh, on the library, garage, housing, retail project stated, um, as are slated for lot four. I specifically urge the council to follow the heritage tree ordinance that states a heritage tree can be removed only if, and I quote, a construction project design cannot be altered to accommodate existing heritage trees or shrubs, close quote. So far, that hasn't happened. There's no evidence in the correspondence or records of meetings relating to the Lot 4 project that the city ever asked Jason Architecture to consider saving any of the trees on Lot 4, even though a dryad, dryad arborist independently assessed those trees and concluded that none of them was recommended for removal. No matter how disposable any of you feel trees may be, the Heritage Tree Ordinance is there to assure that every step be taken to preserve them if possible. It falls to you to take every step. And one of the first ones would be to ask Jason Architecture to assess what trees could be accommodated in the design of this project, since none of them on their own would be recommended for removal. This would be crucial information to have for the February 28th meeting when this project would come back to the council for final approval. So I thank you for that consideration. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Ms. Bush, do we have someone else online? Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Lyra Filippini here. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and Council Member Newsom for requesting a council review of the Parks and Recreation Commission's decision concerning the heritage trees at the slot four project. I very much support this coming to council at a future date, but I am concerned about the timing. As noted by the Arborist reports, many of the trees are worth saving. Unfortunately, the public record shows that there's been no consider consideration of our heritage trees and associated ordinance until an appeal was filed. But now that the design has gone this far, the majority of the trees located near the interior of the project footprint makes them poor candidates for possible incorporation into a design alteration. However, a few of the trees along the perimeter could be incorporated into the project with alterations to the design and program square footage. For instance, a reduction or elimination of the commercial space component. I greatly hope you will consider asking the architects to follow the heritage tree ordinance and ask them to undertake a design modification to incorporate at least some of the perimeter heritage trees for instance, it would be lovely to have a front facade of the built block long building broken up a little by a possible library entrance patio framed by the large and healthy liquid ambers with hope for an outcome that honors and brings together our community. I thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from the next person who's with us here in public. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, council members and Mayor Keeley. Um, my name is Susan Cavalieri. I want to also uh, support the idea of bringing this issue to the council at a later date. Um, we know that right now we have been suffering from uh, flooding in our area. Lot four is a lot in the flood zone. 
and I would hope that the city council might ask for an alteration of the uh, multi-use library garage housing project in order to save some of the heritage trees. These trees absorb a large amount of water during rainstorms. Their large canopies provide shade and cooling during times of heat, and they counter the ur urban heat island effect. Most importantly, they absorb a lot of uh, climate heating carbon in their large woody structures. Again, please save some of the big, beautiful trees on Lot 4 for our health and climate resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Yes, sir. All right. We'll go to the next person online. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Fred Geiger, longtime Santa Cruz resident. I wanted to appreciate the fact that you are going to look into this matter further. It is important as you're finding out to a lot of people to, well, actually see the city council, which is a law making body, consider actually obeying the law. Um, you know, as a taxpayer, it's very irritating to see when the council becomes arrogant and decides they can do whatever they want to do, and then ends up having people take them to court. Uh, the recent wharf plan is a good example. And then the taxpayers are stuck with, I believe, is a $77,000 legal bill when uh, the council finds out that they actually do have to obey the law. So I'm encouraging you to take a good look at the Heritage Tree Ordinance. It does require designs to be modified to accommodate heritage trees. I'm sure you all would say in public, oh, yes, I support heritage trees. Here's a chance for you to show us that your uh, talk is actually activated in actions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. They sound like a Good afternoon, council members and Mayor Keeley. I'm, ple I'm, I'm pleased to be able to speak today. I'm also addressing the issue of removing the heritage trees from Lot 4, and I do support the effort to putting it forward to council. So please consider, in the meantime, keeping some of the heritage trees on Lot 4. In the design of the library garage housing project planned for that location, the consulting arborist for that project said that five of the eight trees were worthy of preserving. The City of Santa Cruz Heritage Tree Ordinance clearly directs all building projects to include existing heritage trees in their project design if possible. The easiest solution would be to include the two liquid ambers at the outer edge of the project. It would be non-trivial. I mean, it would be trivial, not non-trivial. They would take up less than 2,000 square feet of the design. The architects have included in their design 10,000 square feet of commercial space. It is possible that they could alter that. Please follow the Heritage Tree Ordinance and include some of the trees on Lot 4. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Ms. Bush, someone else online? No, we have nobody else, unless somebody wants to press star 9 to raise their hands. But as of right now, we have nobody. Very good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Phyllis. Actually, my new name is Joy Phil. Taub Greenleaf, and I just turned 80 years old, and I consider myself an example of a healthy heritage tree. <laughs> um, I think flexibility is one of the, the key facets of intelligent human behavior. I know that the architects who made this plan which includes a childcare center and a library, are also well aware of the climate crisis that our world is in right now. Every tree is important. We're here to advocate for the heritage trees. If some of them were even baby trees, I would still be here advocating for them. There's going to be a children's center. 
What a wonderful educational opportunity for children. My former um, profession was early childhood education. Trees. What trees give us as human beings? What trees give the planet? Are so important for children's education. So there you're going to have a child care center. And you're going to be able to say to the children, we changed our plans, we grown-ups, because we know how important trees are to your health, to your life, to our planet Earth. So I want to say to you, please, not only because we have a, a sensible ordinance, but because we understand the climate emergency that human beings are facing in the entire world. Every tree that is healthy is important. Please honor the trees. And I want to refer you all to the wonderful song that the Banana Slug Band wrote many years ago. And they sang it at many music festivals all over the country. It's about what a tree is for us. And it's called I'm a Tree. It was written by the Banana Slugs. Let's honor our Santa Cruz tradition and planet Earth. Don't cut down any of those trees. Modify the architectural plan and honor our children and our planet. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Good afternoon. <laughs> we'll hear from you first, then we'll hear from someone online. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Roland Sayer, and uh, I want to appreciate you all for thinking about something really important. Uh, it is uh, not possible to assign any kind of weather event to climate change, but what we're experiencing right now is to, uh, in complete agreement with the predictions that our climate scientists have made, and they also have uh, pointed out that there will be worse than what we're going through. And so it is upon us to think about what we can do to keep things like this from happening. Now, one tree won't save the climate change issue. That's ridiculous. But this is a, an incidence where we can act locally while thinking globally. And uh, every tree, particularly the grown trees that we have in Lot 4, are the best machine to remove carbon from the atmosphere. We will not be able to save ourselves, our civilization, by just uh, stopping to emit uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. We also have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and climate uh, and trees are the best way to do that. Grown trees, much more so than little saplings. Uh, they will eventually grow up and rise to the level of grown trees, but these trees need to be preserved. This also means that the city has to be much more vigilant and much more determined to think about how what we can do about climate change. We have a climate plan, but if we look at the trees that have been felled in the last few years, it's ridiculous. We're not doing enough. And it's upon you, the council, to tell the administration to stick with the laws that we have on the books and follow the, the laws that we have. And put some bite into our policies. What's happening now is happening uh, with less than 1.5 degrees centigrade warming. This is less than the goal that we have set ourselves. If we don't act, by the end of the century, we will have 5 degrees centigrade warming. And I'll leave it to your imagination to think about what that will look like for the world and also for us here. Thank you for your time and for your consideration. 
Ms. Bush, we have someone else online. We're going to be right with you. We're going to hear from someone online, then we'll be right with you. Thank you. Ms. Bush, we have someone online. Thank you. Welcome. If the phone number ending in 5347 can. Yes. I, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. This is Cynthia Matthews, and I'm calling in to support the action before you to continue uh, the, the two items to a consolidated hearing. Many of the speakers have suggested that the city did not follow the Hort Heritage Tree Ordinance um, in the issuance of the permit, but in fact, the conditions and the process were strictly observed, including detailed arborist reports. Uh, they made the findings that justified the permit. As you know, that was appealed to the Parks and Rec Commission with a very detailed and long hearing, and the Parks and Rec Commission uh, denied the appeal. It's understandable, particularly that the newer members want to uh, consider this anew. Um, it makes total sense to consider that item the tree removal permit in the context of the entire project. The historic tree ordinance does not require that a, that a project be redesired, redesigned to um, protect a heritage tree, particularly one or more than one that are not in good health or good candidates for being moved. It simply requires that the process be observed and that the uh, requirement that a tree be protected uh, is not absolute. Uh, there is the uh, consideration that protection be considered if the project can be redesigned without uh, compromising the project. In this case, the tree removal is necessary for realization of a very complex project, which it should be pointed out, has been designed with the most state-of-the-art uh, and forward-looking, environmental, sustainable, climate-conscious uh, characteristics. So, uh, in, in short, I support the action before you uh, and bring all these issues forward at one time uh, 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 before the entire council. Thank you. Ms. Matthews, thank you for calling in. Good afternoon. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Susan Worth. I live in SoCal in a leaky trailer, in a senior trailer park. I'm deprived of people of all ages, except for seniors. <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't know where we got this crew of seniors, to tell you the truth. But nonetheless, I am, I am just mortified that we even have to think about this that we have to worry about those trees and our farmer's market. It's the only thing that I've ever found that was a community and worth living in this area for. That farmer's market and the lovely library, the, the Carnegie Library, I can't believe that they're just going to put that in the landfill. How wrong is that? And Cynthia Matthews, we know, owns a lot of property around here. And Excuse me she'll never confess. Excuse me for just a moment. If you would stay on point, that would be helpful. Thank you. We need to move this ahead to a, to a later date and, and a later time so people can be here. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else on? There is nobody. Else. Anyone else wish to testify on this item? Good afternoon. Is there anyone else on the phone? You, you have the floor. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good I'm afternoon. Jane Doyle. And some of you have seen me here numerous times. I'm afraid this time I'm not quite as well prepared as usually because I've been out of town and I'm just catching up on some of what's happening about the heritage trees. I'm also very impressed by what everyone else has been saying. A lot of the points that were in my mind, frankly, have been made about what this will mean in the future, what it means right now. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I actually studied forestry and have a personal place in my heart for trees, so there is that is carrying me forward a little bit here. But I want to bring up something that I haven't heard mentioned, 
And I think it's one more arguing point for Santa Cruz to be very representative of what the county wants. The county has just released, as far as I can tell, just released um, a climate action plan. And part of the idea of a climate action plan for the county is how we can make a difference, how we can, for example, increase the amount of carbon sequestration. I can't even say the word. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think that if you think about when you're trying to decide if this goes to the Planning Commission and so forth, that we do want to be carrying forth what you just talked about in the last item, health in all matters. And trees are very contributive, contributory to our health, as we know. I'm not saying anything that everybody in this room doesn't already know. What I'm trying to do is hope that I can influence you to support going forward and giving us more opportunities to um, advocate on behalf of the trees, which can't do that for themselves. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, still no one else online? Um, that's right, no one else. Good. Ms. Schendeldecker, good afternoon again. I also don't have a whole lot to say that other people haven't said already, especially Roland and Jane. Um, I, I would just put in another voice for balancing the needs of our environment and the people who live in it, and balancing the different policies and um, priorities that we've come up with as a community. So if we want climate change mitigation, if we want a uh, library and affordable housing, you know, we have to make some compromises. And so I appreciate that this is back on the agenda, and I hope that um, it isn't just a sort of symbolic um, process that ends up with a sort of just reaffirmation of what has already been um, decided. Um, because I, I do think the trees are significant. Uh, as Roland said, they're not the only trees, but they are significant trees. They're significant to um, not just carbon sequestration, but the, the um, mental health of people. And as other people have brought up, when you have a school or a library or senior housing across the street, when you can look out the window and see a tree, there are very different outcomes for your, your mental and emotional, social well-being. So we cannot look at the trees just as simply like a, you know, old school environmental conservation that's just blind to housing justice. Um, or label it as just nimbyism, anti-growth nimbyism. It really is about balancing our very own needs within our own bodies as complex environmental beings. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let me ask if there's anyone else who wishes to, to provide testimony. With the sign, do you wish to testify? No, I just... Okay. Okay. Very good. I think I think that says what you want to say. All right, uh, Mayor, we do have another else? caller. One other person online. Let's hear from him. Good afternoon. Yes. We can yes. hear you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Gillian Greensight. I wasn't going to call in, but. Um, I was listening, and when I heard um, the statements from Cynthia Matthews, I felt I had to call in to make a correction. Uh, Ms. Matthews is correct in saying that there is no, that the requirement to um, accommodate heritage trees into a building site or into a project is not absolute. That is true. And the city has, as its resolution, three conditions that um, uh, allow a heritage tree to be cut down with respect um, to uh, those desiring to take it down. However, she is incorrect in saying that um, the project design being altered 
uh, is only if it doesn't compromise the project. That is inaccurate. If that were the case, then developers um, bringing a project forward that there's a heritage tree on site would simply say, oh, we can't uh, accommodate that because uh, it would compromise the project. No, the resolution states clearly that a heritage tree can be removed if the design cannot be altered to accommodate the tree. Not cannot um, be altered if it doesn't compromise the project. So we come back to the question of, that's quite an absolute statement in this regard. The question is, can this design be altered to accommodate um, some of the trees? Now, that's not how it should have worked. It should have worked right at the beginning since the city was the developer saying to the architect that uh, we need to accommodate some of the trees, so design to do that. But that didn't happen. And the public record shows that quite clear. There were no conversations about heritage tree accommodation. So now we're at the end of the line with a design uh, which should have accommodated them, but it's uh, better late than never. And there's a chance now, if you direct staff to direct the um, developer, sorry, the architect, to make a slight um, alteration, suggestions have been made, then it will be possible to have the best of all possible worlds, preserve some of the heritage trees and have a project to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greenside. Appreciate your participation. Anyone else online? There are nobody else now. Anybody else who's with us wish to make further comments? <laughs> Act before the council. Mr. Newsom moves the recommendation Second by the vice mayor under debate and discussion. Ms. Brown. So, so I'll you. Yeah. look left, look right. Um, so I just wanted to make a, a comment about uh, the, the request from the community uh, that that really goes beyond what's on our agenda here. And, and I want to say that I, I support that. I support uh, asking our, the architects to, to consider ways to incorporate um, the trees. Um, and having been involved for uh, much of this, the length of this process of, of developing the library uh, project, I'm, I have asked the question of the architects. It's been informal. I was on the library subcommittee um, and was involved in conversations with Jason Architects. Um, uh, so I have a, a pretty good sense of what the answer would be were we to take that action formally here today. Um, and, and I think the answer would be no, it's, it's not possible. Um, but I would like to find a way to have the conversation about, um, I know that, that folks have talked about some of the trees, um, maybe not being as, um, uh, maybe being a little bit easier to accommodate. And it is something that's of interest to me. I will do what I can at this end to follow up with those conversations with our staff. Um, but I, I just want to say um, clearly now uh, that it, I'm not, I don't have uh, um, a lot of optimism that we're going to be able to make a major change to the project. Um, as much as I would like to see that happen. So um, I feel a responsibility to say that here um, because we are, um, I imagine, going to uh, move this decision to a future meeting. And I agree that the council, um, I, and I want to thank my colleagues for bringing this to us because I do believe the council um, should consider all of these uh, in tandem and that we should have the final say. This is a major project. It's a city project. And um, I will c continue to advocate uh, at this end uh, as, as I can. So um, thank you, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Ms. Contar Johnson. Great. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom, for bringing this before us. Um, I think Councilmember Brown kind of got to it. I wanted to articulate and clarify for everyone listening that this item is not to, at this point, um, overturn the Parks and Rec decision. 
around the heritage trees. This item is for us to consider all the permits all at once in, um, as it pertains to the downtown library and affordable housing projects. I want to clarify that for all of us and everyone who's listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Newsom and Mayor Keeley. Um, it makes total sense to align um, consideration and action of all of the permits for this development uh, to the same upcoming meeting. And I would like to just um, suggest that uh, s several of the the community points and concerns um, be addressed or be considered at that meeting um, when we hear all of these permits at the same time. I think that would be very helpful to have some informed data. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask if there are other comments, further debate and discussion. Seeing and hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Just before we recess until we come back in an hour and five minutes for our 5 p.m. item, uh, a couple of comments by the chair since our regular business is, is, is finished for the afternoon session. I wanted to take a brief moment and uh, share with my colleagues, with the public and, and those who, uh, and city staff as well in terms of presiding. Uh, it is my thought that uh, that the way, a way to preside at, in such bodies is to be fast but fair, and not in any way to shut off debate, discussion here on the dais, nor to shut off any of that with our members of the public who, who participate. I do think that it might be helpful, and I've discussed this with colleagues uh, before being seated, and with the city manager and others since being seated, that I think it would be helpful as a matter of custom and practice going forward uh, to do a couple of things. Uh, one is to ask staff to limit their public presentations to 15 minutes. If they believe that they need longer, they can make a request of me or, or the city manager and we will make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, let me tell you what underlines that. Uh, I don't believe this is a good place to use the Army way of educating, which is to tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. Uh, that works well in the Army. I'm not sure that it works necessarily very well here. Uh, I'm going to work on the assumption that both members, staff, and the public have read the item and that it is unnecessary to have a complete repeat of what is in our staff reports and in our packet. Uh, I'm not sure that that serves a particular purpose. I do understand that there will be times where there could be, excuse me, <clears throat> where there could be appeals and other items in front of us where we are required to have more complete presentations. But I think a summary presentation by staff is can be quite helpful and maybe can uh, expedite the work that we have. I want to be very careful that you understand what I just said. I didn't say the staff reports aren't important. They're critically important. But they have an opportunity to write about that. We have an opportunity to make calls and talk to people. So does the public before we have our hearings, and before we have our sessions. Second item is that I think it would be helpful as a matter of practice if what we were to do here on the dais is that we have an item, we get the staff report, we ask if there are any clarifying questions not speeches disguised as questions, but actual legitimate inquiries that you couldn't have gotten the answer to before the hearing. 
So I would encourage you to ask as many questions as you can prior to showing up here. Uh, next, it does seem to me that what is very helpful after having gone out to the public and received their input, either through a formal public hearing or the opportunity to comment, is if when the matter is back before the council, that what we are debating and discussing are motions. So as the presiding officer, the first two words I would like to hear out of your mouth when the matter is back before the council is, I move. Now, you can move whatever you want. <laughs> no restriction. You can move the staff report as is. You can move your own motion on what we should do. You can move the staff report with six amendments to it that you would like to see. But the first two words need to be, I move. And in that, let me take another step or two. It would be helpful if the motion is stated in its entirety first before you wish to make comments. So in other words, I move the staff report with the following two amendments, this amendment and this amendment. There it is. If we get a second, then you can open on your motion and we can have all the debate and discussion that is helpful for us to have. So I'm not trying to close that part down. But what I would like to do is instead of having a salon, have actually debate and discussion on motions because this is an action body. That's what we do, is that we take action. So that would be helpful if you would do that. The chair will certainly, or the presiding officer, will certainly recognize motions to amend and substitute motions. So we're clear on how I see that, and if I need further educating on this, please tell me. But a motion to amend is essentially, I agree generally with the motion, but there are these items which I would like to amend. Contrast that with a substitute motion. A substitute motion is, in my way of thinking about it and hearing and presiding, a substitute motion is there's no fixing this motion. You can't, there's no way that you can amend and amend good enough for this motion to be what the member would like to see it be. So motion to amend is I can generally agree with this if these amendments are adopted. Substitute motion, as I see it, is I can't get there from here, and I'm offering a substitute motion. So in terms of how we will proceed, that is uh, how I, as the presiding officer, would like to conduct our meetings. I do have a sense that what that will do, or I'm, the intention behind this is to make sure that we get our work done in an expedited, expeditious fashion without in any way reducing, eliminating debate and discussion on this dais or with the members of public. If you have any question on that at this time, I'd be glad to, to respond to it and see if that sounds uh, about right for folks. Sound about right to you? Okay, very good. Uh, we have finished our afternoon's business. We will be here again at 5 o'clock, but between now and then, we stand in recess. <laughs> Let me call the evening session of the Santa Cruz City Council's meeting for January 10th, 2023 to order. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Uh, present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, we will 
move to oral communication this evening. This would be an opportunity for anyone to address the council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on tonight's agenda. Uh, let me ask the clerk, uh, do you have folks who will be calling in? We do, yes. Let's start with this gentleman here under oral communication, then we'll go alternating back and forth. Good evening, sir. Hello, I'm Steve Lazarus. I live in Santa Cruz on, uh, on North Pacific. Um, I want to, uh, the issue that I want to raise, I don't want to uh, have a discussion about it. But I would like just a one-sentence answer to the question that I will ask about it from one of the council members, if I may. Um, the issue relates to the fact that the current council and all the councils uh, recently have represented only about 50% of all the citizens voting. And I would like uh, the council to be willing to arrange for a discussion with at least one member from our group who have some practical uh, alternatives to the current voting method that would allow many more citizens to be uh, well represented in the council. And uh, I would like, therefore, to ask the, uh, somebody on the council now to answer this request, uh, uh, at least answer my uh, question in some way, please. How we deal with that for, so that we're clear with each other. So oral communication is not an opportunity for us to engage in dialogue with you. I think what will happen based on your testimony or your oral communication this evening is somebody may choose to reach out to you, but we're not going to engage in a back and forth with you on this. It, it doesn't comport with yes, the I, rules. Yes, yeah, I recognize that by Good. my first comment saying I was not expecting a discussion. But I would like a, an answer okay, now from you've one of the council twice. members on that issue, please, because I would like to uh, give the opportunity for the council to display its interest yeah, in I being it fully the first, representative me, of as many citizens as possible. Excuse me. I understood it the first time you said it, and I clarified what we can do and not do. So thank you for your testimony. Well, I, no, you can no. do this. You, there's no restriction on you doing I'm not what I'm asking you this. to do. I'm not going to debate how we proceed with you. I've told you well, how I'm we're going to proceed. Citizen. So thank I'm you for your citizen. communication. Thank you for your communication. Well, I, I wish you had responded in a more civil way. Bonnie Bush, we got somebody else online? We do. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. All right, sounds good, Joe. Yeah, uh, my name is Hector Marin. I wanted to uh, just, uh, you know, first off, I'm um, start off with this entire, you know, meeting and saying that, you know, I hope y'all are remaining safe throughout these times and these storms. Uh, I hope y'all are, y all, y all, that y'all and your families are being safe because I know it's really hard for the storm right now. Um, but yeah, I quickly wanted to address two matters. I think one matter was um, the fact that we should have a much more open democracy throughout our, uh, throughout our county and throughout our city, right? Um, the one thing that, that we can debate on several things and on going about several efforts when it comes to housing, uh, certain planning developments, et cetera. But the one thing that we cannot argue, and I believe we're all on the same page, is having a representative democracy. So I wanted to second the voice of Steve Bosworth that's, that, that, that seeks to expand all that message of having that direct democracy so we can ensure that every voice is counted and that every vote is counted on. I feel like it's something that we can all agree on. I'm Latino as well. So when I was engaging with several folks throughout our community, they all feel like voting is a waste of time within the Latino community because it doesn't go in the efforts of Latinos and BIPOC folks. So I hope and I invite the council to sort of have this sort of um, engagement with us, the constituents, with us the citizens, and with us the organizers to expand on this democracy. Um, the second matter that I also want to address is the, uh, is the uh, downtown development project that's going on. Um, I appreciate Fred Keeley's efforts in limiting Ms. the Mr. story. Um, Mr. Story Marin, yeah. if I could just take a second here. That is a matter on our agenda this evening. So oral communication is for those matters under our jurisdiction, but not on the, on the agenda this evening. So if you would like to call back on that item after oral communication when we get to it, we'll be glad to recognize you for comments on that item at that time. Thank you, sir. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Schendeldecker. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to very briefly just say I agree with Steve and Hector that I would I that I would like us to have community conversations about increased representation. Um, but that's actually not the larger comment I want to address right now. Um, I would like to sort of harp on about um, our emergency response in, in relation to people who are unhoused. But I'm actually not even going to harp on about that. I'm going to point out to everybody that our city and county emergency plans do not adequately address really like nuts and bolts of how to help people who are in vulnerable, at risk, or um, you know, people who have functional needs and access issues. In our documents, it's pointed out as this like little like, you know, insert, like side note, like these are communities that need extra help in case of emergency, right? There can be complex trauma, physical or mental issues, transportation, poverty, um, of service animals, of children, elderly, all sorts of issues. Issues that all of us in this community either have experienced, are experiencing now, or will experience sometime in our lives. So this is something that affects all of us and should not be a little like chocolate chip in the corner of a cookie of our emergency response plans. This should be fundamental, central, to all of our emergency response plans. And it needs to be really communicated to the public that we are working on this and taking it seriously. We had these floods a year ago, and I don't see anything in our documents that advances our emergency response planning for people who are vulnerable or at risk. I don't see anything that says that we have consulted with those communities. So I'd like to see a million times more action on that. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Schindel Decker. Anyone else? Do we have other folks online? There are. Mm -hmm. Let's go with that. Good evening. Good evening. Um, hi, my name is Sabina Holver. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. I wanted to call today about two items in regards to the storms. The first is regarding emergency shelter. I really can't believe that in a city with as many unhoused folks as we have, that there wasn't a basic emergency shelter plan in place before the storms hit. The Civic Center opening was incredibly helpful to get people into safety, but it was extremely frustrating to see it closed down by Matt Huffaker right before yet another atmospheric river hit our town. All other shelter available was full or inadequate. For example, tents are not adequate for people during storms like this. They need real shelter and they need to be able to stay for the duration of the storm, not kicked out at 8 a.m. arbitrarily while it's still raining. The council needs to come up with a real plan for emergency shelter that can be enacted immediately without all the scrambling that was happening this past weekend. That scramble time makes it harder to actually take care of folks and increases the possibility of loss of life. I'm seeing that 17 people have died across California during these storms, and a couple of those people were unhoused. I know of at least two in Sacramento. The second item that I'd like to talk about is West Cliff Drive. It's time to close West Cliff to cars. The pedestrian and cycling path needs to be pulled way back in preparation for future inevitable erosion that will just keep happening. All year long, even in great weather, we've been seeing the walking path and cliffs erode and fall into the sea. At this point, it's hazardous. One of the best days of the year last year was during open streets on West Cliff. I took my kids, we hung out with neighbors, and we thoroughly enjoyed all of the space available. Removing cars from West Cliff will make West Cliff a safer space for all, and I really hope that you guys take that up in the next few sessions. Um, thanks for the time. Bye. Ms. Holber, thank you very much. Anyone else wishes, wishes to address the council under oral communication? Ms. Bush, do we have additional folks online? We do, yes. Let's go. Good evening. Good evening. Um, from, I missed the beginning, but this is public comment for items not on the agenda, so it's not the time to ask about comment about the uh, development plan downtown. It is correct that this would not be that time. So, uh, Mr. Van Hua, if you would like to call back in, 
to make comment on that, that would be fine. Otherwise, you can continue now providing comment on any item not on our agenda, but under the city's jurisdiction. Um, let's see. I think I have a okay. Here, I just returned from Italy. By the way, my this is Gary in Um I just returned from Italy, where uh, they seem to be in love with uh, QR codes over there, and I I got a I got a parking ticket parking ticket, and they had a QR code to pay it, and I as much as I don't like it, it was extremely convenient. And I would suggest the city look at doing QR codes on their parking tickets. I think that would increase the um, uh, collection because it's very convenient. Just take care of it right there. No phone calls, no letters, no website to log into. It was, and it's a simple, a simple QR code. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I got another comment. I have three minutes or a minute left. Uh, I noticed the bench lands is completely stripped of grass. And, of course, after the weather, you're going to be redoing it. May I suggest that you look into uh, use artificial turf, that there's a football field that up in Menlo Park that's going to be redone. And, frankly, I just bought rolls from another football field for $150, uh, the dollar a square foot, that I'm going to do with my low, low, low uh, water landscaping at one of my properties. And this is an opportunity to put really high quality industrial strength artificial turf in the bench lands for a very um, a very attractive price. Anyway, if um, I think you know where to reach me if any if there's any interest. So thank you, and I'll get back to you on the next agenda uh, agenda item. Very good. Thank you so much. Good evening. All right. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Abby. Um, first of all, um, this, I'm talking about the emergency, um, what happened with, um, the last few days when the shelter, uh, the civic was open. I want to commend whoever was running that shelter. It was, I did not hear one complaint. For those of you that know me, I am, I am full of complaints. <laughs> Every houseless person I spoke to that were, that was there really appreciated it. So to be kicked out a few days later during the rain was horrible, which I was there when they were being kicked out. So um, <sighs> took a few notes. When they were being kicked out, I was told that they were going to be given other opportunities for other shelter places. This is what they were given. They were given this one page and these other resources. So I took a person in my house that's been staying there since, since it was closed. And she's called every single one of these numbers. Now, she has also a phone, but most people don't. No one called her back until yesterday afternoon. So this was, uh, excuse my language, bullshit. Um, so this did not help at all. So I don't know why you're saying that this would be taking care of people. Um, so it's taken her five days to get a phone call back. She still doesn't have any housing. Um, I drove her to Cabrillo, so, so she's getting shelter there. I went to the vintage church where there's supposed to be um, a shelter last night, and they told me, well, there's no evacuation. So obviously it was just for house people. But people that are out with, with, no, with no housing at all, aren't considered an emergency. This is inhumane, very inhumane. I wish you would rethink how you do emergency. We've been having this way too long where you should have something more organized. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush? OK, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Jared Phillips. Hey, despite, uh, well, refer, before I say anything else, I. I was very impressed with the new mayor putting his hand on the Constitution when he took the oath of office, and I hope he keeps it there. That was fabulous. Anyway, despite the hotel tax increase and massive fee increases routinely voted through by the council, I can't imagine the long-feared scenario of yearly growing deficits won't materialize soon enough, very possibly if this year's budget plays out as expected 
and there will be no funding available except to defer and raid capital improvement projects until, like a bad landlord, the place gets condemned for a lack of maintenance. I would make the point government cannot or should ever try to do everything and that it is not in itself or should operate irrespective of the economy and population size as a growth industry. And again, I would mention it should provide only what the pervasive consensus will of the people is in wants, needs, and that they are willing to pay for and that and no more. In some future years, perhaps it will be 2023, the public might pay less. If so, the government should adjust in kind. Doing things like agreeing to no furlough provisions in union contracts defeats those needed adjustments. Running the reserve balances down to zero leaves the city open to disruption, vulnerable in emergencies, defers maintenance, and makes borrowing money difficult. It seems like a budget item badly needs to be installed to rebuild reserve balances over a reasonable period of time until a target balance is achieved that cannot be spent except in extraordinary circumstances which need definition. That means a will to cut waste and expenses needs to appear. When the balance is achieved, some say 16% of your operating expenses, those rules of when and why that balance can be spent, I suspect, also need examination and not just because... In Thank you very much. Anyone else with us who wishes to comment on oral communication? Ms. Bush, anyone else? One more, yes. Okay. Good evening. Reggie, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to just kind of go through a couple issues. Um, the first, we, where Abby was bringing up the notion of people getting a paper and then having to call a bunch of numbers to figure out resources. I brought this up in a meeting actually with um, council member Kalantari Johnson, which is that we can very easily make this entire system better by just having a Google spreadsheet that has public view access and write access only to the service providers. The service providers can effectively just write where the vacancies are, and then the public can just see it. And then the public doesn't have to call and do this back and forth and waste everyone's time and just make unhoused people literally like seek out their own services. And then this also cuts down on the need for case managers and caseworkers. We could cut a whole layer of just wasteful bureaucracy out of just the discovery of whether services are available by having a Google spreadsheet for people, right? Which costs nothing. Um, so I really encourage, really encourage the city and the county to, to coordinate on just making that little tiny change because you'll save money, everything will be better for everyone and we'll actually have an understanding of what our service capacity is, which we don't have now. Um, and so I don't really have a whole lot of time to go over the second issue. So I'll just kind of leave it at that uh, so that it's <laughs> the focus is please make this incredibly simple change. Otherwise, I'm just going to go organize and talk to all the service providers and just ask them to do it myself, right? Because that's all we're really trying to get at here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meisler. Anyone else online? There are no more. Anyone else? with us this evening and like to provide oral communication to the council. Seeing and hearing none, we are on agenda item that is brought to us uh, this evening uh, by Council Member Newsom and myself. The way we'll proceed on this is that uh, we will provide brief presentations then we will ask for a brief presentation from our city planning staff who has reviewed this and provided an attachment of their own on this. With that information, we will then go uh, out to the public looking for public comment on it. It will then be back before the council for debate, discussion, and action. So let me recognize my colleague, Mr. Newsom, for opening comments. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, so the agenda item uh, that we will consider tonight uh, reflects the feedback I heard during the past campaign. I consistently heard two things uh, as I knocked on doors and spoke to residents of my, uh, in my district. One, 
uh, that people wanted more housing, especially affordable housing. But two, they did not want buildings that were too big for our community. I did not speak to a single person who wanted 17-story buildings in our community. The proposal that we will consider tonight is a good faith effort to obtain these goals. And I am very happy to partner with Mayor, Mayor Keeley on this uh, agenda item. I think this is where the past council was heading uh, on this issue. So this agenda item, I think, will make that correction, that direction clear of where the past council was heading. This proposal tweaks the current downtown expansion plan south of Laurel by creating guidelines for building heights, the total number, the amount of total housing, and the amount of affordable housing in this plan. Specifically, this proposal calls for no single building in the downtown expansion plan project to be taller than 12 stories. It also calls for 1,600 dwelling units in the downtown expansion plan, and it calls for 20% of all residential units uh, built in the downtown expansion plan be affordable housing. Just to further quantify that last point, this plan calls for 320 units of affordable housing to be built in this area, middle class and working class housing in our community, housing for, say, teachers, social workers, construction workers, uh, and park workers in our community. Now, it should be noted that our city operates under a different regulatory environment than it did um, in the past due to state legislation. And this plan, therefore, uh, directs our staff to accomplish these guidelines by establishing policies that, to the maximum extent possible, will attain the goals uh, outlined. Uh, in closing, I just want to give a reminder that our discussion this evening will be the first of many on the various projects uh, in the downtown expansion plan south of Laurel. Uh, there will be plenty more opportunities for public input uh, on the various projects that will be proposed in this area. This proposal will be a guide to those discussions, uh, though, by limiting the building heights um, in the area and providing for the maximum number of affordable housing units possible in a financially viable manner. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Butler, you're recognized for a staff report. The, the camera isn't working here for us. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, and I have with me Sarah Noisy. She is the Director, excuse me, <laughs> Project Manager, Project manager um, for the, uh, the Downtown Plan Expansion and uh, Senior Planner with our team. Um, I'm going to frame the issue a little bit and then speak uh, briefly to the specific items that um, have been brought forward by Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom. So building heights are controversial in nearly every significant project we work on in the city, whether it's 35 feet and three stories or 16 stories and 175 feet, as was considered and as is being currently considered for one building in this downtown plan expansion area. People have strong feelings about where we should grow and how we should grow. And anecdotally, at least, most people are uh, of the opinion that we should not be growing out into our open space areas. So Hoganip and De La Viega or expanding into our agricultural lands to the west. So the area where we will develop is generally fixed. And at the same time, the state is bringing strong mandates for how much cities must increase their planned housing capacities. And for very good reason. For many years, California cities have not provided adequate housing to meet the needs of our population. And that has led to many of our societal ills. So the state has stepped in and has not only increased how much housing we must plan for, what we know as our RENA, or Regional Housing Needs Allocation, but it has also increased the implications of and enforcement of not planning for sufficient housing. For us, our RENA numbers increased by five times between the past nine-year cycle and the upcoming eight-year cycle. So we need to plan for at least 3,736 units to uh, be able to be built in the city between 2024 and 2031. So to meet those goals, 
we will need to roughly triple the rate of development that we've seen over the past seven years. And with these state housing growth mandates, it's not a question of whether we plan to grow, it's a question of how we plan to grow. And that's one of the things that we're talking about here this evening. Since growing out into our green belt is not an option, growing up is what we must do. And that growing up does not come without heartache. And we hear that regularly. We heard it um, for this particular item in much of the correspondence. Um, whether it's concerns about traffic or parking or shadows or about community character, all of these factors need to be balanced along with other factors like employment capacity and alternative transportation options have to be balanced with the fact that for the residential capacities called for by the state, we need to plan for those. So before the council tonight are some very important policy considerations for the downtown plan expansion. I won't reiterate all the points from the staff report, but I'll touch briefly on uh, the three main ones. And also a long, I'll, I'll note how density bonus needs to be considered. So the first is the number of stories, the second is the number of affordable units, and the third is the total number of units in the plan area. Number of stories, of course, is directly related to the total number of units. And the policy direction under consideration in the mayor and Councilmember Newsom's report contemplates a limit of 12 stories inclusive of density bonus. As stated in the staff report, developers have a lot of leeway when it comes to density bonus and how they provide those additional units that are allowed by state law. But if the council is desirable, is desirous of a 12-story max, um, then staff can work on policies that would make that the most likely outcome when a 50% density bonus is applied. And I think that's the, the approach that we would need to take with this is looking at an anticipated 50% density bonus as we would likely see with um, projects coming in. This is really a policy decision for the council, uh, balancing the factors like community character and community sentiment um, with things uh, like this being in close proximity to the highest concentration of jobs in transit um, and in, the, in the region. So the council also needs to consider that if there is a reduction here, that, uh, that delta of units is likely going to have to go elsewhere in the city because we do have to plan for that 3,736 units. And so though that's a, a key uh, policy consideration that the, count, that the council will want to think about um, in making this determination. The second policy direction uh, that's under consideration is the total number of affordable units. And staff can create policies that call for a total of 20% of the units being affordable, inclusive of the density bonus. The question is really whether the projects will be viable at that um, affordability level. And if this is the direction of the council to have 20% of the gross units as affordable, we will have to work closely with the developers to consider and study and evaluate a variety of potential compliance paths that can allow for the policy to be implemented in a way such that it does not become a barrier to housing. Because an outcome that we do not want is that we do not get the affordable units nor the market rate units. And finally, the council is contemplating, as part of the recommendations from the mayor and Councilmember Newsom, the uh, maximum of 1,600 units in the plan area. Uh, the state has invalidated growth caps, so we can't put an outright cap in the plan. But as noted in the staff report, we can craft policies that in anticipation of all the projects utilizing a 50% density bonus, we would likely result in a 1,600 unit maximum. Um, we, um, as noted above, the number of stories clearly affects the total residential capacity in the plan area. So we will need to study that interrelationship and report back to the council on our findings. And I want to point out that we do have some caveats in the staff report um, with respect to 100% affordable projects or small units and so forth. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about those if you'd like. Um, but um, again, the shifting of housing to other areas of the city is another key consideration here. Um, we can, however, put in policies that would limit the, uh, would likely limit you to 1,600 units in the area if that's the council's desire. 
Um, finally, uh, we noted in our agenda report that we recommend, and Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom also recommended that we continue to study 1,800 units in the Environmental Impact Report, or EIR. This is not the last time the item will be in front of you. Studying 1,800 units in the EIR provides you with flexibility for future decisions. For example, if through the RENA um, allocation process and uh, the sites analysis of where, intense, uh, where additional housing capacity is added, if it's determined that it would be beneficial to include additional units in the downtown plan, you would have the flexibility to do that um, if you are studying those 1,800 units. Um, also, 100% uh, affordable projects could use the density bonus allowances um, for unlimited density or smaller unit sizes, as I mentioned. So those uh, factors could actually get us above the 1,600 units, even if we're targeting the, the 1,600. Um, so continuing to study the 1,800 units is important, and that would in no way preclude you from approving the plan policies that include an anticipated maximum of 1,600 units when this comes back before you at a later date. With that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Butler, thank you. Appreciate your the brevity and the uh, focus on your staff report. Thank you. Let me ask if members have any clarifying questions based on what the staff has said. Is there any clarifying questions you'd like to ask at this time? Okay. Let me uh, let me invite members of the public to uh, to provide us with testimony you can start by lining up over here and i suspect we are going to have some folks on the phone is that correct miss bush so what we'll do is alternate we'll start with someone who is here presently then we'll go to the phone come back to someone we'll alternate back and forth so whoever would like to lead off on this good evening good evening good evening city council uh, my name is uh, jaime artiaga uh, I've been a resident since uh, 1969, which th it was the year I was born. Um, I'm in uh, support of expansion and housing, more than anything, affordable housing, because everybody looks out for the homeless. You know, I, I, I'm with them too. I'm not against it. But nobody's ever looked out for the diminishing middle class, right? At this time of diminishing wages, mass inflation, nobody speaks out for us. My son, with the masters, he had to move to the Fresno area to uh, attain a home. He could rent, he could keep on renting, but we, he wasn't able to purchase a home here. So this, this will do two, two things, or three things. This job, I believe, will provide livable wages for the working men and women that are gonna construct this job. Another thing, it's gonna be, hopefully, local hire to provide jobs to the local men and women of this area, which um, is really hard to attain because we don't want to build. So I've been uh, doing the mega commute for 30 years, which I'm not crying about it. I'm happy, but I love my area and I would love to work locally. So yes, I support this job for the economic benefit that it's going to bring here locally. Hopefully we have local hire to spend those dollars here in Santa Cruz. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. Let's go to someone on the uh, who's calling in. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I do not believe the state and MBAG suggestions for housing expansion take into account that people are actually leaving California in droves. Maybe it's the high taxes, the toxic political environment, but no matter, they are leaving. The only driver for population growth is now illegal immigration and birth death, but that is now coming up short. So great is the exodus. There is no growth. It's a false narrative. I'm trying to envision 12-story buildings, perhaps without parking, and what that means in congestion and a reduction in quality of life. Bigger buildings didn't make San Francisco more affordable. Bigger buildings didn't reduce LA's homeless population. It all just made for more congestion. You can be part of that density madness, or you can try to manage it more sensibly. A reduction from 225 feet to 175 feet tells you people don't want the high skyscrapers, and 175 feet is still quite tall. It also math it is a mathematical fact that the law of diminishing returns applies to making housing affordable with each extra added story. 
Affordability comes from lower construction costs, which matter more. In the end, you are responsible to the people of Santa Cruz. And if that means measures should be taken to mitigate authoritarian non-local mandates where possible, you should. And if that is the will of the people, I see little appetite for really tall buildings here. As, a, as the cost is self-admittedly uncertain, that's not a plus either. Uh, unless some of these 12-story buildings are 100% affordable, this 2080 split is just more of the same. Assuming an unlikely endless supply of people that would live to, like to live in Santa Cruz, I doubt these structures will do anything really to provide housing for service people who might perhaps be commuting from elsewhere, as there will just be more people to service and more service people needed, and the housing ratio remains unchanged but more congested. This threat issued that if the density isn't created downtown, it will go elsewhere in the city, but that didn't set well with me when I first read it. I see no acknowledgement that the fiscal immorality of the excesses of the federal government's debt bomb and zero interest rates are the primary reasons responsible for inflation of asset prices, housing construction costs, and rental prices. A future with a higher percentage of renters doesn't sound like a better future to me, but that will be the result unless there are also condos built along with rental apartments. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good evening. The, pres the presenter of the uh, plan so far, very clear and precise. I only want to emphasize that uh, if, if it was only possible to meet the ho housing uh, quota by having 16 floors, then uh, because of the existential price crisis for the homeless, it would be worth it. But of course, if you want to reduce it to 12, that could also be accessible if it is part of a comprehensive plan for Santa Cruz that in other ways the neatest need will be met. So what I would like to be considered is to have not only uh, uh, piece by piece presented at separate times, but each piece be presented as a comprehensive plan to meet the housing needs. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush? Thank you. We can hear you, I think, if you speak. Hello there. Hello. This is Darius again. Uh, question. I have to have a, a building in a critical part of the downtown development plan, uh, expansion. Uh, it's a, in three of, the scenario, three of the five scenarios, I believe, the Warrior Stadium goes right through half a dozen tenants' uh, living rooms in this building. My question is, have, what is the process for acquiring these properties? What is the process if other, own, own, other owners refuse to sell? Are you prepared for eminent domain? Is there a, other alternatives? Of course, I don't expect answers to these questions on this, this venue, but as somebody that's impacted, as well as 18 tenants, many of them on Section 8, um, I would like to have this dialogue with somebody in planning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good, e good evening, Mayor, City Council, and uh, community. My name is Tony Ezzel. I am the Senior Business Agent for Corpus Local 505, located at Aptars, service in Santa Cruz County, as well as a Senior Business Agent for Monterey County, Corpus Local 605. And the carpenters of uh, Santa Cruz County fully support this project. I'm speaking on behalf of those hundreds of members. And um, as it is written right now, the compromise on the height density as well as affordability that was crafted, we support that as well. Okay. We look forward to working with the city as well as uh, Santa Cruz Warriors and building this project. Uh, looking over the next hundred months, I'm sorry, over the next months and years to uh, bring this vision into a reality for the city of Santa Cruz. And one thing I do applaud about this project, a lot of times we look at affordability as well as affordable housing. Sometimes we seem to forget that the people that are building the houses not getting paid a livable wage. With this project, there will be a livable wage that will be paid to the members that are building this project. I'm also a member of the Builders Trades, and I got some of my constituents here as well. And uh, in addition to that, uh, 
health care would be paid by the building of this project. And not just health care for the members, but they're for their families as well. So we're looking at projects being built. This project will help not only the carpenters, but the members of the building trade as well as a whole, as well as the communities, because they can put that money back into the community, which help the community. And not only it eliminate the, the burden of the city, as well as the county, trying to provide health care for those individuals that don't have it. So we definitely support this project, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. We appreciate it. Ms. Bush, someone online. Lira Filippini here again. Good Thank evening. you and hello. Hi. Um, I hope you all will support Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom's amendment to the original downtown expansion plan and that you will request changes to the study parameters of the associated EIR. The part of this new proposal I find most compelling is the 20% inclusionary requirement to be inclusive of density bonus. This would be particularly helpful with our community's need for affordable housing considering how few affordable units are now proportionally being proposed in most market rate projects after the addition of a density bonus. As you know, Mayor Keeley's proposal also indicates a 1600 maximum for the number of units. It seems important that this maximum of 1600 be the focus density studied in the EIR, not the 1800 proposed by staff. I'm hoping that council will provide further clarity for the community and direction to the staff for the EIR study on a couple additional elements of the new proposal. For instance, what number of 12 story buildings would be permissible? Please set specific number and their locations and heights as was done in the original proposal. Additionally, what is the actual height limit to be set for these 12 story buildings? Will it be 120 feet, assuming 10 feet per floor? Please set a solid height limit for the study and associated proposal. The reduction of heights from 17 story limit to a 12 story limit is a much more sensible proposition, though still one and a half times taller than the current tallest building in Santa Cruz, which still does impose many associated impacts to our infrastructure, carrying capacity, health and safety. So I do remain concerned about our infrastructure's ability to withstand this magnitude of growth, as well as the possible dangers associated with flooding, earthquakes, liquefaction and evacuation capacity for this proposed density increase for such a small area. However, I strongly support the sensible changes to the plan being proposed by Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom and hope for clarification to the details. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Filippini, for calling in. Good evening, Mr. Barron. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Uh, my name is Frank Barron, um, long-term uh, city resident and uh, retired city planner. Um, I want to thank you, um, Mayor Keeley and uh, council members for this opportunity to comment on Mayor Keeley's proposed revision uh, to the downtown plan expansion. Um, the current proposal approved by your council uh, back in June um, includes one 17 story building and three 15 story buildings in the south of Laurel um, project area. On the plus side, Mayor Keeley's proposed revision would reduce the maximum height to 12 stories but on the negative side, it would not place a limit on the number, the number of massive 12 story buildings that could be built, nor would it place any limits on the building footprints as does the current proposal. This could result in the whole South of Laurel area being covered with hugely out of scale and out of character high rises, twice as, twice as tall and massive as the ugly behemoth that's going up right now um, at the former Taco Bell site. Imagine that, twice as tall as that, and twice as massive. The overall impact of um, the mayor's proposed revision would likely be far worse than the current proposal, despite the lowered height limit. A better approach, one that would um, accommodate most of the downtown plan expansion project's objectives, including the uh, 1,600 new units with 20% uh, affordable, and a new Warriors Arena, would be to um, instead of having a blanket area-wide 12-story height limit, lower the heights of the currently proposed four tallest buildings by five stories each. That would lower the single tallest building, proposed building from 17 stories to 12 stories and lower the other three adjacent tall buildings from 15 stories to 10 stories, inclusive of density bonuses. Then keep the remainder of the uh, South of Laurel project area at the currently proposed height limit range of 
between five and eight stories, inclusive of density bonuses. Um, if your council were to adopt uh, this scale-backed uh, scale -back hybrid approach, um, I think you would find that opposition to the project would virtually disappear, or nearly so. However, there will be considerable opposition if either the project is currently proposed or Mayor Keeley's proposed revision uh, with this unlimited number of, of massive 12-story buildings goes forward. Given that this proposal con constitutes the biggest, most significant land use change in the history of Santa Cruz, one that will forever change the character of the city and, and due to uh, recent state laws, cannot ever be undone, your council should carefully consider how you, how you will want to be remembered. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Barron, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, someone else online? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Lane, good evening. Good evening. My name is Don Lane. Though I'm connected to a handful of affordable housing organizations, I'm speak speaking tonight as an individual. I don't envy you sorting out the challenges of this item, item, but I'm happy you're taking it on because it presents an opportunity to make substantive project progress on meeting our community's housing needs, especially the affordable housing needs we have. The goals are really worthy achieving 20% or more of affordable units within the planning area, moving us toward greater housing density in the proper location, going high enough without going too high, and facilitating a permanent home for our beloved warriors. I especially encourage the idea of council and city staff working with the property owners to create a development agreement that meets our community's goals and avoids running afoul of state rules and objectives. Please don't overlook the possibility of having the property owners provide a substantial piece of land in the expansion area to an affordable housing developer as a way of maximizing the opportunity we have in this zone. I also want to put in a word for not overly limiting the number of housing units downtown to meet our affordable and workforce housing needs and requirements. Downtown is our best location. I think putting the council's good focus on affordable housing and on concerns about height together with the city staff's diligence in complying with state housing law and city planning processes can actually lead to a very good outcome for our community. We continue to make great strides in meeting our housing needs and maintaining the diversity and inclusiveness that's essential for our healthy community. Let's keep it going tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Good evening. Hello, council members. My name is Casey Vanden Heuvel. I'm the president of the Monterey Santa Cruz Building Trades Council, as well as the representative of the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104. I'm here tonight, and tonight you're going to hear me say two words housing and jobs. And throughout this discussion, you're going to hear housing and jobs through my public comment. Right now, we're worried about how the horizon of the downtown area is going to look. And right now, that horizon does not have housing or jobs. So I look forward to that change to have housing and jobs available for our residents. This amendment it's square smack down in the middle of where we want to be. Not too high, not too low. Let's go right in the middle and let's move forward so we can provide these residents with good work and construction jobs and long-term jobs in that commercial real estate. We also need to provide housing. That's the number one issue we have here in Santa Cruz. And how do we do that? We are a dense little city here. The only way to do that is to move up. So I support these recommendations to the expansion, and I support housing and jobs. That is so important to this city and its members of my union. So please move forward on this action and let's get started on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanden Heuvel. Ms. Bush, someone else online. There is. Good evening. The 
person who is calling in, good evening. I will let you know it looks to me like maybe that person has muted. They're still muted, yeah. If the person with the phone number ending in 5542 can hit star six to unmute yourself. I'll tell you what, while that person's figuring that out, let me uh, recognize our next speaker. Good evening, sir. Good evening, worthy mayor, worthy council members, and your city staff. Great job on uh, what you did in your report there. Real good job. Uh, Manny Panero is my name. I'm the CEO of Monterey San Cruz County Building Construction Trades Council. We are in full support of this project. It's important. It turns into a viable economic engine for the city of Santa Cruz. You need housing, you need good jobs, with great health care, great livable wages. Not only that, you start young people in a career. Not all kids are going to go and get a two, four, six, eight year degree. This gives them an opportunity to work here. We want to work with the city here. We want jobs to stay here. Put that money back in your community. That's where it belongs. So get this project going. We're here behind you. Thank you and hope to see it break ground soon. Mr. Pinero, thank you so much for being here. Have we got our person online set up to go now? Yeah, I just um, went to the next person. We'll go back to that. Very good. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Member. Uh, my name is Jesse Bristow with Swanson Builders, and I wanted to um, call in, in support for the staff's uh, original recommendations for the downtown expansion. And the, the reason being is um, when it comes to arena numbers and the original 1,800 units that are being proposed, um, we have an eight-year cycle to and to get these right and if we uh try to limit those amount of units it's going to be spread out throughout the city and it's uh my opinion and i would i would feel that a lot of planners would agree with me uh given my professional background being in planning as well that the, the more concentration that you have in a downtown and a more walkable area with uh, the transit center and um services and jobs and things like that the better uh, you know, Mission Street, Water Street, SoCal Street, that's where these other units will end up being allocated and they're not as, it's not as walkable areas. So, you know, we have one shot at it and I really feel that um, allowing the higher density in, in, in this location would be the best. Thank you, Mr. Bristow. Appreciate your testimony. Good evening. Hi, my name is Trisha Durham. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz for the last 42 years. And much of that, I've been an educator of low-income students and families and Spanish-speaking families. So I want to quote from Jane Jacob's book, The Death and Life of American Cities. If you don't know her, she fought diligently to preserve communities and neighborhoods and faced really destructive, ruthless development projects in New York City. She quotes, building cities, we have the capability of providing something for everybody. Only because and only when, only when these ideas are created by everybody with the input of those who will live there. So I'm urging you to oppose this 12 stories, the 12 story development. I think that if you compare, I've done some research Personal research, I traveled through Europe on my bike mostly for several weeks last summer, and you see that beautiful cities create beautiful experiences. That's why people are drawn to this town. It's a beautiful city, it has a lot of open space and nature, and the buildings are of human scale. They provide a lot of space and sunlight, not dark, cold canyons. Right now, I'm about to switch my bank because at the community credit union, it is very difficult not only getting there on a bicycle, which is my mode of transportation, but as I stand there during a sunny, bright day, I'm in a dark, cold canyon, and that experience is not gonna draw UCSC students or more tourists to our town. Also, I want to question the state data. I'm very familiar with the regional housing need allocations and other cities are fighting this, that the allocations have been, the numbers have been overinflated. If you do, if you look at similar cities of our size and our population, 
throughout the world, we're talking Europe and the US, the majority of buildings in those cities of that population are not more than five stories. So I want you to get our input. I want you to consider a lower height limit. And I also want to question just for other educators and teachers, because I've been here before and they've said, okay, we're going to have 20% affordable housing. And then the housing is actually not affordable for these educators, not affordable for the police. The prices are just not truly. So how can you guarantee that local workers, these gentlemen here will actually build this? How can you guarantee to us that the people who work in our town will get the housing? Because they aren't currently now. Many of many educators, police have to work, you know, drive from Salinas and Watsonville. And that is adding to this extreme weather. For those of you who don't, you know, understand it, carbon driving puts more carbon to the air and is causing more flooding, more historic fires in our future, more historic droughts. So, um, yes, streets must be attractive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Someone else online? Yes. Good evening. The next person that was the same person who wasn't. Good evening. Come on forward. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is April Welsh. Um, I've been in the community since 84. I was drawn by UCSC, raised my daughter here. Um, I do have um, a lot of attachment to the environment of Santa Cruz and what, what I was drawn to in terms of living here. And I'm also, I know that you guys are in a very difficult situation in terms of trying to meet the needs of our community. I'm definitely for more employment, um, for affordable housing, for more housing. My question is like, who is all this housing for? I mean, my question also is like, would any of you want to live there? I wouldn't. I mean, I've lived in a three bedroom house, rented, rented to students, done everything I could to create a beautiful environment for my amazing 24 year old. And um, these are not beautiful environments for people. People need space. I mean, I think the density model is a fallacy, you know, and, and I know I work with all low-income people through the county. I'm an energy specialist for PG&E, and um, there's tons of areas. There's even, like, apartment buildings that really should be torn down and rebuilt. You know, it's like, why are we doing this in this particular area in this model where it's just going to block out the sun and create not a beautiful environment? You know, we're a tourist town where, you know, people are drawn here uh, for the beauty of this environment. And this is not a beautiful project, you guys. It's not. I'm really, really sad that you would even consider it for a community. I think there's just so many other options. I think it's, I think you're blindsided. And also I do have a question too about the number, um, the number of units I think our city is way overzealous about that. I'm curious to know what Watsonville, what, what are they having to build there? How many units is Watsonville having to do? And isn't there some way for us to be able to debunk what the state is um, requiring or, or requesting for us in terms of the amount of units? So, and I'm, frankly, I'm in jeopardy of having to leave Santa Cruz because I just, you know, it's just gotten so crazy in terms of affordability. It makes me really sad. So, thanks for listening. Thank you for participating. We appreciate it. Ms. Bush, one more time. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Keeley and fellow council members. My name is Anthony Viscuso, and I'm a business agent for the Heat and Frost Insulators Local 16. Um, I apologize in advance if, uh, if my comments are going to sound uh, as they've already been echoed by other people, but I'm going to speak anyways. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the project tonight as it will bring much needed opportunity to the city of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz has a high demand uh, for affordable housing due to the decreasing size of the middle class. If this project is built uh, with a possible community benefits agreement, it will create these opportunities for local Santa Cruz residents. With community benefits such as local hire, our union is ready to hire new Santa Cruz apprentices that will benefit from a six-figure income, paid health care, and a guaranteed pension. 
These new apprentices will be trained for free and complete their programs with zero debt. These are jobs that do not require any college experience. Furthermore, after this project is completed, our union will continue to provide them with work throughout the rest of their careers. Since these apprentices will be residents of Santa Cruz, they will spend their hard-earned money uh, locally, which will boost economic activity. If this project is approved and a community benefits agreement is not used, um, your community will get a project built by the lowest bidder with the least skilled and trained workforce available from contractors outside the geographical area. Any monies earned on this project will benefit outside communities and place the integrity of the project at risk. Construction workers take pride in building projects in their own community. We build with integrity to make sure our excellent work is on display for decades to come. We all like to drive by a project and point out to the other people in the car, hey, look, I built that. Please think about moving forward with this project and give serious consideration of how to best serve your community, beginning with the construction phase. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your participation. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I have something to share with. If you'd give City that Council. to the clerk, she'll be glad to distribute that. Thank you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start the clock over right? because you, you handed something out. I don't want to count that against yes, your time. So go ahead. Thank you, sure. um, Council and Mayor Keeley for allowing me six minutes to represent the oh, Stop you, the Skyscrapers. You had called in and asked for that in yes. advance, I recall. I yes, had emailed. Did. Yes. So will I be able to, I guess I'll keep track up there. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of a group of citizens that have associated around the phrase stop the skyscrapers. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk here. My name is Susan Monheit, and uh, I've recently moved back to Santa Cruz. I graduated from UCSC in 86, and I've moved back after a 30-year career in environmental protection, water regulation, water rights. Uh, this group was formed by neighbors talking to neighbors. When I learned about the project, the density and the height being proposed, originally 22 stories and then reduced to 22, um, I started talking to my neighbors and nobody seemed to know about what was going on or the scale of what was going on. Um, and when they found out about it, they were oh, distressed, appalled, very, very concerned. Um, okay, there are many concerns about a project this massive and of this density. Um, although in an EIR, traffic congestion does not legally have to be analyzed, the people who live here know it is, will be a reality and would request that that be, be analyzed as part of the EIR. So a, our core... A few um, core members of the, of the group reached out to Mayor Ke then uh, candidate Mayor Keeley to discuss our concerns and share an initiative we drafted to try to give people of this town more of a voice to be recognized. Whether the group decides to move forward with an init a ballot initiative will largely depend on whether we feel the voices are being heard and, and our considerations being taken into consideration. So, Fred did listen and he has taken action, which is number 24 on today's agenda. And um, I would like, just like to applaud new council member Newsom and, and, and Mayor Keeley for hearing us and, and taking action, moving us in the direction of lower and, con and uh, confined density or specified density that the group wants. And in general, I would say the group you know, is not unified we all have different opinions, and for part of the group, um, there is not enough specificity in how many 12-story buildings or where they would be located to uh, enamor uh, support at this time. Those things need to be better identified and, and should be analyzed as an alternative project in the IR 
with some more specificity so we know what it's talking about. Uh, there is a big concern here that too many 12-story buildings or not enough space between them will create dense, dark canyons of microclimate that is cold and dank and not a place where anybody wants to be. I have asked that, uh, I, have, I have passed out um, a couple of photographs I'd like to refer to. This is from Jan Gell's book, Cities for People. And as we are going to, you know, going to be building a new city or a new downtown, that is a foregone conclusion, I really want to empower this council to create a vision that is livable, that is desirable for our town and not follow a developer's vision that is designed around maximizing profit in order to fund an arena that nobody wants to pay for. So um, there are two photographs there. One shows some perspective of a town um, where massive buildings were built behind it and it's out of scale and out of step. The second shows that above five stories, people begin to lose connection with what's going on on the ground. And they lose connection with community, with each other. Um, so I really want to in invite this council to create a vision that will be inviting, that will maintain a destination location that we currently are, and that will create a vibrant economy that is sustainable. Um, yes. When I think of where I want to travel, it would be to a place that has ambience and sunshine, and that is what I want to create here. Um, and to that end, I would like to make an invitation to this city council that Laura Lee, who actually owns this book, but I would like to give it to the mayor, to Mayor Keeley and the council, with an invitation to flip through it and look at the concepts of, uh, from this Dutch uh, person, author, and, and engage in some conversations with people about creating something that's vibrant and unique that people will want to come to. And in just saying, we're creating a $1.6 billion development here. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, in, in so far as, thank you, in so far as many of us don't uh, we have policies of not receiving gifts. Huh. Your gift is to the city, correct? Uh, yes, it's Thank to the city much. for, then, then for we, everyone. We do not have to, uh, that won't be a gift to us as individuals. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Someone else on online here? Would this be Ryan? Yeah. Right. Good evening, sir. The city? Is this why I give it? Yeah. Good evening, Council. Uh, this is Ryan Meckel. I'm calling in on behalf of myself and Santa Cruz Yimby in support of the staff recommendation and the original plan for 1,800 units. Uh, if we want to build a city where people can actually live and build a city where people can live sustainably, this plan is a portion of, it helps to achieve that. I, like earlier people said, and like staff said, this is a place where people want to live right in downtown. And if people are living downtown, they may not have to own cars. They could bike to work. They could take the bus to work. They could walk to work. It's where a lot of the jobs are, and it's where the housing should be as well. In addition, if we reduce the number of units in this area, it's going to make it more difficult to achieve a certified housing element because those units are going to have to go somewhere else in the city. And as I'm sure you're all familiar with, people are not exactly thrilled to have units anywhere in the city. You're going to have opposition no matter where you go. So I hope you'll stick with the original plan and with the staff's recommendation on this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks for calling in. Good evening. Good evening, Council and Mayor. My name is Chris Sagers. I'm a long-term resident of Santa Cruz. And I think people get lost in this house, this concept of housing for people. Um, it's, it's needed. However, um, there are reasons why high-rise sky rises kill livability. High rises separate people from the street. Activity is best viewed from the street, from people. 
you lose contact with people inside. A high-rise scale is not human scale. High-rises radically reduce chance encounters and pro propinquity, it reduces chance encounters, creating livable cities and connection with people. High-rises are vertical sprawl, taking up too much space and is inefficient. High-rises equal gentrification and inequality, increases profits for developers, expensive, the taller you go. Buildings tend to be luxury units for global investors, anything about five to six levels. You're looking at global investors that are paying for those extra floors and is not gonna be available to working class, construction workers, police people, et cetera. Number six, it's not eco and green. They use twice as much energy as mid-rise buildings. You're looking at cooling, air pumps, water pumps. They're required to cool and heat the upper floors. It's not good for our health. It deprives people of neighborhood spaces and activities. They encourage people to stay inside and imprison people. The other problem with skyscrapers, pollution. More materials, increased carbon footprint, and, uh, and um, substantially interfere with climate causes. Um, the taller buildings create heat islands. Heat is trapped between the street and upper floors, especially if you're gonna have multiple high-rise buildings. Creates a valley effect, creates winds. Winds hit the, the taller buildings, go down on the, on the ground. Um, and just a second here. Sure. And the buildings totally um, take over omnipresence of people on the, on the street. Again, they're energy inefficient. And um, yeah, that's about all I have. And I oppose this um, height limit amendment. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Bush, someone else online? Yes. We do. We have a handful of people. Yeah. Mr. Sapperman, good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Ali Saperman, and I'm here on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition, calling in strong support of the staff recommendation. I generally work in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, but after hearing the attempts to limit density downtown, I wanted to offer a regional perspective. Regionally, as we all know, we are in a housing crisis and cities throughout the Bay are responding by increasing height limits and adding more adequate housing, um, especially downtown and near transit. And often the best way to do that is to increase density. Um, and Santa, uh, Santa Cruz should not be an exception to this rule. Um, it is important that we do not limit ourselves in terms of density. And um, if I have any caveats to the staff recommendation, it would be to increase the density that is proposed. It was said earlier tonight that you should consider how you want to be remembered. And the way you ought to be remembered is a city that encourages all residents to be successful. And the best way to do that is to support the staff recommendation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sapperman. Appreciate you calling in. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Bill Kempf. Uh, I'm a downtown business owner, a DTA board member, and an architect who's practiced locally for 27 years. I encourage the City Council to support the Downtown Expansion Area Plan, EIR, as it was approved last year. The South of Laurel District is the best area of the city to rezone. It will easily accommodate increased residential density as required by the state housing element cycle and help to expand the city's commercial core. The community has rejected growth outside of downtown. The corridors plan went nowhere. The Circle Church development was hotly debated. Large-scale residential development in the downtown benefits everyone. More people living downtown creates more customers for local businesses and restaurants. They will drive less and energize the streetscape. Also, having the Santa Cruz Warriors here is a privilege and a point of pride. They deserve a downtown venue we all can be proud of. An EIR is a study, it's not an ordinance. We should study the maximum density possible for this area. The planning department did the hard work and outreach to create the parameters for the consultants to review. 
Those findings should be analyzed and used to inform the ordinances that will guide the future zoning. The largest building volume should be considered. Most of the current buildings proposed and under construction contain micro units because the financing favors them. We need more residential volume so there can be a mix of units that are larger and more appealing. We desperately need affordable housing. Raising the threshold to 20% was the right thing to do, but affordable units are incredibly expensive to build. I have a 100% affordable local project uh, where each SRO sized unit will cost $400,000 to build. State density bonus law is the only option to make these high density projects pencil out and be attractive to developers. I don't see a way to adjust this law that won't be challenged in court. I care deeply about downtown. I spend most of my time here. I'm invested in it. A year ago, I moved my office from the outskirts to above Pacific Avenue. I want to live here too. I look forward to nice apartments and condos with amenities that will entice me and my friends out of their large empty nests and live a more sustainable and walkable life downtown. I'm not concerned about relatively tall buildings downtown. When I go to a new city, I search out the tallest observation deck to get an overview. If there was a place downtown where I could see over Beach Hill to the ocean, I think that would be awesome. A varied skyline, skyline should be explored throughout downtown, not only in this area. It is becoming more uniform as each new building is, is added. In closing, I'd, I'd just like to say that I'm excited for the future of downtown. I'm glad this plan is being presented and reviewed. It's an opportunity for progress and change. The locals I talk to downtown want this. Think big. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush. Mr. Meisler. Hi, can you hear Good me? Good evening. Yes, we can. Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to speak to the conflict that we keep running up against here between wanting to serve housing as a commodity versus housing as something people need and live want to live in. Obviously, when we're talking about, you know, I want you guys to build as tall as you need to build. And I need to hold the dialectic, obviously, here that the reason you're building 80% market rate, even though that's clearly not what we need, and 20% affordable is because that's what the market is demanding of you. And investors are leaning into these kinds of demands, even though rents have gone up year after year after year, somehow they can only still afford 20%. It just doesn't make any sense. There's no way that overheads have increased the same amount as rents over the past 10 years. Rents have gone up like over 100%. So we need to be real about what the numbers we're talking about are and like what we're actually doing when we're like building housing and what goals we're trying to achieve. I think if we want to be, if we want to hold a better balance, we can start to think about maybe building housing that starts out a little bit subsidized, but then we give um, every single person a Section 8 voucher, for instance, until the developer gets some overheads paid off, and then you basically set it at a lower rent permanently after that, right? So you can do things to take care of the upfront overhead over time. You don't have to have a bunch of money up front. But the, th the, the fact that we're, we're not even thinking about it this way, we're just sort of accepting the idea that developers just need to make a ton of money no matter what, and 20% is always what pencils out for developers. I mean, it's like, you remember plane tickets used to not cost that much, and the problem was diesel was too expensive, like, what was it, 15 years ago. Then, when diesel got less expensive, the plane ticket price didn't change. That's the situation we're in, right? This The market is not based on overheads. It's based on speculation. And so you guys need to understand that and treat it that way and make up systems that sort of operate to counter that problem. Because otherwise, you're not actually helping uh, address people's needs. You're just chasing an unsustainable situation that's really just driven by the speculative nature of the profit makers. And so... I hope that was clear about what I'm talking about. I think I don't give a shit about height limits, excuse my language. 
but I do care about whether you're thinking about these things in a way that's equitable. Nicely, thank you for calling in. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Murphy, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Murphy, president of the Santa Cruz Warriors. Well, I just want to first by start out saying hopefully everybody had a great holiday season, enjoyed some time with their loved ones, um, and is finding a way to stay dry and safe right now. Uh, as many of you know, the Santa Cruz Warriors are celebrating our 10th anniversary season in here. Um, since our arrival in 2012, the relationship we've enjoyed with the community, with the city, and all of its constituents has been nothing short of amazing. Um, we've had a lot of success together, both on the court and off, uh, as well as in the community with the almost 2,000 community events we've participated in since arriving. We hope to be a part of the fabric of Santa Cruz for a long time to come. Uh, we believe this proposal moves us closer to the dream of building an arena in Santa Cruz. We want to make it very clear that we desire broad-scale community support uh, to build a new arena, a building which is required in order for us to stay here and call Santa Cruz home into the future. In that context, we embrace Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom's efforts to find common ground in respect to the overall height, density, and affordability in relation to the downtown area south of Laurel Street. We recognize that the housing needs of Santa Cruz are far greater uh, than building a new arena downtown is of importance. We especially embrace all efforts to bring meaningful, affordable housing to our community. That said, uh, we're committed to working out the details of the South of Laurel downtown expansion plan in a way that meets the city's planning goals, the needs of the community, the needs of the warriors, and to create a viable economic model that facilitates the building of a new arena so that the C-dubs can call Santa Cruz home decades into the future. I want to thank Mayor Keeley, all the city council members, and all the city staff for the hard work and effort that's going forth to make this dream a reality. Thank you. Have a great night, and go Warriors. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Someone else on the phone. Good evening. We can hear you. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm on Tom Rand. When the downtown plan extension process began some time ago, the public was led to believe the South of Laurel redevelopment and gentrification process would be comparable to the downtown plan. How misleading this has turned out to be. On June 14th of this year, the council approved 170 and 150 foot buildings to be analyzed in the EIR process, overriding staff's original proposal of 180 and 220 foot projects. Now the city led by Mayor Keeley is attempting to tone down the pending outrage to this overdevelopment proposal. A similar outrage and back backlash occurred in the history year in the late 1960s when the council approved Lighthouse Field for Hilton Hotel Conference Center. The current staff report pushes back on Mayor Keeley's attempt to ameliorate the fallout from the publicly unpalatable heights and density plan currently proposed. The staff report puts forward 12-story buildings throughout the area. The six-plus-story building, uh, fondly known as the Taco Bell Project at Laurel and Pacific, feels way out of scale. 12 stories nearly doubles the height um, of uh, and, and buildings that can't be looked, they're not found anywhere in the plan area as proposed in the current staff report. Unlimited 12 story developments instead of the 150 to 170 foot buildings is outrageous and appears to be a giveaway to real estate and development interests. This is almost worse than a few 150 to 170 foot buildings. 12 story and taller buildings should remain in San Jose and Santa Clara Valley and not mushroom out in Santa Cruz. Try to imagine the process underway and ask yourself if staff's vision is the Santa Cruz you have come to know and love. Staff has said the city has no choice but to continue to build massive developments in order to comply with the arena requirements. I say hogwash. There is major statewide pushback to the arena, and the city of Santa Cruz must join in as well as lead to not only question the validity of the numbers, but to roll back these excessive state mandate. The EIR should be analyzing the project area with 1,600 maximum units. An accurate project description is required under CEQA. The downtown plan extension should plan for no more than 1,600 units as Mayor Keeley and Council Member Newsom have set forth. 
Keep the height, density, and setbacks the same as the downtown plan. Keep our local coastal plan intact. Simply, the downtown plan extension should be in line with the downtown plan, nothing more. At a minimum, Mayor Keeley should be supported in his attempt to rest control over the planning process from staff. Your decision today could have lasting implications, and I thank you for the time. Vince, thank you for calling in. We appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kathy Haber, and I have lived in uh, Santa Cruz since uh, 1969. Um, and I would just like to bring up a couple of items that I believe have not been addressed. First of all, the streets that you're planning to build these buildings on have ancient infrastructure. The pipes underneath those streets are probably more than 100 years old. I wonder if the city is planning to replace all of that infrastructure. If they're not, they will have to do that. Are you thinking about that? Also, the streets are not particularly wide, and they're going to have to be expanded to four lanes, which was going to do away with all of the parking on the sides of those streets now. Are you requiring that these huge apartment buildings provide at least a half a space per unit? The people that come into Santa Cruz to live in these buildings, it's not going to be local people that live there. There's going to be new people that live there. They are coming with cars. Are you making provision for these facts, these actualities, these realities? Or are you just living on cloud nine with all these buildings you're planning to build? And my other, another consideration is we've heard from the labor union representatives. When I drive by the behemoth that they're building on the corner of Laurel and Front, I don't see any trucks with Santa Cruz construction company names on them. I see construction companies from all over Central California, but I don't see Santa Cruz construction companies there. I don't think there's any way the city can build into these contracts with these contractors anything about union labor. My ex-husband was a union member for 40 years. Most of the construction projects in Santa Cruz were not union. All of the residential projects were never union. This is not a strong union town. I don't think you can build into these private contracts anything about hiring union labor. It will not be built with union labor. I doubt it will be built with local labor. Um, the other thing is you are not representing the people who elected you to office. You're representing developers from outside of Santa Cruz and people who would like to move into Santa Cruz for one reason or another. You are not representing the people who elected you. And that, my, my time is up. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your testimony. We've got someone online who's calling in, and we can now hear you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I apologize. This is Jesse Bristow with Swanson Builders again. Um, my internet connection was a little spotty uh, given the recent weather. So um, I, I don't know where I left off on my last call, but um, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, we, we encourage uh, City Council to move forward with staff's recommendation of the 1,800 units, mainly because... Um, making sure we can allocate all those, those arena numbers and achieve this cycle, um, making sure that the city um, isn't penalized by the state further, where you get certain projects such as 831 Water Street, that was a contentious project because of SB 35, because the city did not meet um, the arena numbers. And I'll just speak a little bit to, um, you know, some of the concerns and, and questions about the EIR and, and, you know, green spaces and articulation and similar to previous comment earlier, is, you know, staff needs to understand the entirety of the build-out, the highest maximum, and then 
furthermore, as the downtown expansion plan, those design guidelines are implemented, there can be green spaces, there can be step backs. You know, someone spoke to, hey, this isn't going to be human scale. Well, you can have a building go up to four or five stories and then have the remaining stories be stepped back. So there's certain articulation and design standards that can be implemented afterwards. So um, really, in a, in a nutshell, we need transit-oriented development so people walk, people invest in, in um, our downtown. You know, right now we're on a borderline recession. Um, it, some would argue that we're in a recession right now. And honestly, the thing to do is to plan during that recession and to come out on top and ready to have that type of investment where people want to live, people want to work. And people want to um, invest in the in the city of Santa Cruz. So, um, thank you for your time, and uh, really appreciate um, uh, everything you guys are going over tonight. Thank you. Thank you for calling back in. Appreciate your forbearance with us on that. Thank you so much, Mr. Reyes. Good evening. Council members, my name is Chris Reyes. I work for and at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, a place I've worked almost every year of my life since I was 14 years old. I'm not very close to 14 anymore, so it's been quite some time. Uh, we are unabashedly proud to be part of the team that helped bring the Warriors to Santa Cruz, and we're very proud to be part of the team that's trying to keep the Warriors in Santa Cruz and find ways to build affordable housing for our workforce and community members in Santa Cruz. And so what's before you tonight is a good and proper calibration of what was done before, and I encourage you to continue this ball forward. I suspect that as time unfolds, there'll be many iterations of this, many changes, <clears throat> many amendments, many uh, opportunities for community engagement on this project and all that it entails. And so this is one step in that direction. So if it's, it feels very appropriate and proper. As a lifelong community member, I wanna also speak to the importance of this project and what it represents. You know, we have this cycle in Santa Cruz that it goes back 40 years where uh, some elected officials who drape themselves in uh, being advocates for affordable housing uh, find ways to vote against almost every affordable housing project that comes before this body. I've seen it over and over and over again. And we need you to be the council that breaks that cycle because there are real consequences from those actions. Multiple generations of Santa Cruz residents can't afford to live here. They can't afford to buy homes here. And the state is so fed up with that that they're basically mandating that we build this kind of housing. And so we need to uh, be good partners in that and find a way to end that cycle of generations of Santa Cruz residents, kids that graduate from Santa Cruz High, SoCal High, Harbor High, uh, who can't afford to live here. It's been going on for far too long. And we need you to be the council that says we're going to find creative ways to end that cycle because it's not healthy for our community to have generations of people that can't afford to live here and that have to leave. And it speaks to our values as a community that we haven't solved it yet. And so we need to find a w way to solve that. And this type of projects are a good step in that direction. So I urge passage. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, someone else online? Um, yes, we have currently seven more people. Okay, let's go to one. Ms. Martin, we can hear you. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you can. hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Laura Lee, and I'm delighted that um, you're welcoming the book Cities for People. Um, it's a wonderful easy read that really highlights forward thinking planning for productive and engaging cities. My concern about the plan is a couple of issues. Is One, it's a time of crises. We're in drought, flooding, emergency services are overwhelmed. And thinking of building on the levee an arena and all these tall buildings seems like a backward looking model for cities. More forward looking cities are more engaged in connecting communities and having people want to stay in places. Building where people have to sit in traffic for hours to get here and then go to a box 
and be in a box and then go to another box and then get back in their car is backward thinking. I think we have to, I hope that you will engage in the conversation that Susan Monheit requested that the community has more input in forward thinking materials, forward thinking designs, which embrace beauty, highlighting the beauty of our town and social and environmental justice. These ideas are being broadened out throughout the country. There are a lot of resources of other communities addressing affordable housing, but are not being forced by developers who are in it for profit to drive the process. We're asking that our community speak directly with you to engage in better, more welcoming housing than high rises and congestion and traffic. We have to address emergency services, climate change, drought, drought and traffic as a part of building our community. And I have faith that you are good people. I've met you. I believe you are good people. And I hope that the book Cities for People will shine a new perspective on another kind of conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Schendeldecker, good evening. Hello again, everybody. Um, so first, I want to um, express my solidarity for the people who have spoken from the Central Labor Council and the building trades that um, um, that a community benefits agreement is something that's really important to them about this project. And from what I heard and learned from them when campaigning was that we actually really need a project labor agreement or ordinance that covers the entire city. Um, you know, it's not just about this one zone or this one project, but the entire city having a standard set for wages, benefits, health care, um, encouraging local workers um, to have those trucks in the, the building yards that are more local and not from hours away. Also, to have more oversight so that there's not wage theft um, and abuse of subcontractors. Um, so that's one thing I just want to mention. Um, I'm hearing a lot in this discussion, and it shouldn't be any surprise, but it's just echoes of the same conversations we've been having. Other people have brought it up. There's this kind of built-in tension between labor, affordable housing needs, and environmental issues. And um, I do think that we, sh we just have to compromise. When the conversation gets ramped up with judgment about what's right, the right and wrong way to do it. And, you know, I hear it from people on all sides of the community. Uh, you know, we're going to get us ourselves into another pickle <laughs> with ballot initiatives and people just yelling at each other and hundreds of thousands of dollars just wasted on advertisements that nobody wants. So, uh, you know, I would like to encourage everybody on all sides from all perspectives to just really like keep the humanity in, in this, that we're all trying our, well, most of us are trying our best. Um, you know, given that we live in this system of neoliberalism for 40 years, like, yeah, this is where, like Reggie talked about, you know, it's not because people are NIMBYs who hate others coming into their neighborhood. They, they hate, they don't hate affordable housing projects but we, we also don't want to see simply exploitation and overbuilding to line the pockets, millions of dollars over years and years being taken out of our community. That's not what people want either. So, um, and then I, I was surprised that only one other person brought up um, the catastrophic flooding that we're experiencing right now and how high the water got to the top of the levee and putting like a billion dollars of big buildings into a flood zone and we know, 
Oh, I'm done. <laughs> I was just getting started. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Sorry. It's just. Um, I'll write a letter to the editor to, to flesh it out more. But it's just, it's a lot of investment. And we are in a crisis. We, you all voted this, this afternoon to approve um, like a grant application to study climate-induced flooding from the river. But then you want to build in that very floodplain where it hasn't been fully studied. So I just, like, I'd like to just, like, maybe pause on the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone else on in. Ms. Lewis, you are up. Wonderful. Um, hello, council members. My name is Portia. I am a community member and uh, employee at Housing Matters here in town. Um, I do not support the amendment to the proposal, and I urge the council to support the original proposal. I feel like I've heard a few straw man fallacies presented throughout um, a lot of the other comments. Um, supporting this project will not lead to the demise of Santa Cruz beautiful green spaces. It will, or our tourism economy, or um, will it turn Santa Cruz into an unappealing place to live? As we know, a lot of people want to live here. Um, when I moved to Santa Cruz from Berkeley, I was shocked with how unwalkable, expensive, and disconnected connected Santa Cruz feels. Um, as a recent graduate from UC Berkeley, I studied climate change and potential solutions to um, reducing our environmental impact. Um, increasing the density of our buildings, creating more walkable neighborhoods uh, that are connected to commercial spaces and to transit, support local jobs, Santa Cruz's local economy. It reduces the need for commuters to drive in. Um, and these are all solutions to reducing emissions and preserving our green spaces and reducing our environmental impact. Um, higher density buildings, more walkable neighborhoods, reduce urban sprawl. And if there's more housing, maybe rents will be less inflated. As a former, a former speaker asked who this housing is even for, well, as I mentioned, I work at Housing Matters, a nonprofit that works with people experiencing homelessness here in Santa Cruz County. I specifically work with families, primarily single mothers and their children, who are experiencing homelessness. Um, mo the majority of these families grew up in Santa Cruz or in the surrounding towns. I can personally tell you that this, this housing is for human beings who need a place to live. Um, and because there is little affordable housing, the majority of these families, and as noted by other speakers, recent graduates and generations of Santa Cruz members um, relocate to the surrounding areas such as San Jose, Salinas, and Watsonville, which are uh, less attractive places to live, as mentioned by the people who really enjoy living in Santa Cruz. Um, and it's also really safe here. Uh, and I've attended other city council meetings where I have not heard people advocating for uh, the empty home tax as one solution to increasing the amount of housing. I also did not hear uh, people fighting against the giant hotel that's being built downtown. Um, so again, I'm in support of the original proposal and it urged the city council to support the original proposal. I do want to add an additional comment um, that I do think we can think innovatively about what this housing looks like. I urge council... Ahead, I take, urge the council and planners to look and into up. resident cooperative housing developments where people share common spaces and resources, which would further reduce the environmental impact and increase um, of the density. Thank you so much for my, your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else with us this evening in chambers who would like to make comments on this item? Seeing and hearing none. Ms. Bush, how many other folks do we have? Six. Okay. And uh, Elizabeth, you are up. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and Santa Cruz City Council members. Elizabeth Madrigal speaking on behalf of the Monterey, uh, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership and as a resident of Santa Cruz. MBEP supports moving forward with the downtown expansion plan expeditiously. And we urge the city to continue studying the 1,800 units that have been evaluated in the EIR. 
Since 2017, MBEP has been actively tracking and supporting efforts related to the downtown expansion plan, especially those that create significant new housing opportunities. The expansion area creates a unique opportunity to plan for more much needed housing in one of the most sustainable sites in our region for growth given its close proximity to jobs, transportation, and other key resources. The identified area for expansion of the boundary of the downtown plan incorporates the development scenario that could potentially include 1,800 housing units, which would greatly assist the city in, re in reaching its increased six cycle arena targets of 3,700 new units by 2030. It is critical that we take advantage of this expansion by adding more housing in this prime downtown location. Thank you all for your leadership in addressing this pivotal opportunity to provide more housing and other key resources to the community. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Ms. Bush, who is next? <laughs> Mr. Kelly, good evening, sir. Hey, thank you so much for having me, and thank you, uh, Mayor and Council uh, and staff. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to put into context a few things that are kind of down the, down the pipeline beyond just this housing. Like, I mean, I, I don't know if I have to tell you that there's homelessness, um, there's high rents, there's overcrowding where people have to live, many people to, to, to smaller and smaller places because there just aren't enough homes. And long commutes, whether those commutes are from coming up into Taylor in the Valley down into the city to work, or if it's coming from Watsonville, Monterey County, and further out to come and work the jobs that are in the city of Santa Cruz. But leaving those aside, which I think are actually much, there's a much greater need than the current RENA number is. And so these 3,700 homes we have to build for RENA, of which a large portion could come through this downtown plan expansion, you're still going to have to meet. But I think other, other calls have pointed out that if you, if you don't pursue large during this one, you're going to have to do it somewhere else. And I think what's important to kind of keep in mind as we go through the housing element process is you have to show that you're going to realistically add capacity to other sections of the city, which is great. Right? It helps us to affirmatively further fair housing, right? It means that we can put more housing nearer to other jobs on the west side, um, closer to campus. Um, and I think it's just in order to both finish our housing element and be able to get the pro housing designation, we, we need to be able to show good faith effort in pursuing that. And not just because we care about numbers on a page and we want to, you know, keep, keep the wheels turning, but because we want homes for people, right? You know, we, we are currently producing less homes than we graduate from our high schools. We, we are currently having trouble hiring people to come and work essential jobs within the city. We are having trouble hiring enough people, recruiting or retaining people to work in our school. Like just ignoring the rest of the, the rest of the jobs that are available and what and what people really need here, there's a lot of untapped potential and and where we have not chosen to lead and say, we need to solve this problem and we need to solve it now. So that's all I want to leave you with. You get to make a decision on it, and it really just means are you gonna to have to make more bigger decisions later, or do you make a big decision tonight? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Bush. Ms. Faulkner, good evening. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council. Uh, we must ensure we house those people who work in service to our community, our nurses, police, janitors, bus drivers, teachers, and others who do not earn the high-tech wages that have been a big part of our housing increase of price. If we are to address our environmental crisis, we must grow our housing with easy access to robust public transportation. If we are to have a thriving, vibrant community as we grow our housing upwards, we must include in all of these developments community spaces that encourage people to connect with their neighbors, the street life, other kids, and visitors within the community. We need to ensure there is a strong interaction between the people in the tall buildings and the street life and ensure integration of young people and elders, people with disabilities, 
people from a variety of income levels as well. The United States has a long history of growing tall projects that fail to thrive because city governments and developers fail to create beautiful, environmentally smart community connecting urban designs. I support more housing infill and upwards development, but we must look at urban design plans that serve to improve people's lives and invigorate our community connectivity. We must also include urban forests and community gardens, encourage safe, active and public transportation to decrease our terrible impact on the environment, primarily due to an automobile centric country. Jane Jacobs was an important role model, influenced wise development principles, which stress that our community must have a foundational role in how our community is grown and developed. How we choose to develop our community in downtown should entice anyone to come and visit and want to stay. It is critical that we invest in safe, walkable, bikeable streets. Traffic violence has skyrocketed over 70% over the past decade and additional 30% in just the past year or so. We can either prioritize speed of cars or safety of our most vulnerable people in our community walking and biking on our streets. So I do urge the city council through these developments to work with the Dutch Bike Embassy, the Community Traffic Safety Coalition, Ecology Action, and the RTC to ensure that our community further, as our community further grows, Santa Cruz implements the best safe streets infrastructure available. Finally, as we remove the homes of the people who live in this area to make way for new housing structures, we must offer current residents comparable or better residential accommodations at comparable rent so that this growth does not result in inequity for the current members of our community living there. We must prevent new development units from becoming empty second homes or money-making vacation homes for the one percenters. Ideally, I think mid-rise four to eight stories is far more reasonable in terms of creating naturally interconnected, integrated communities that invite all of us to walk, sip, coffee, talk together, meet new people, encourage our kids to bike and play with friends. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush. Mr. Davis. Good Hello, evening. can you hear me? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, I'm a downtown business owner here in Santa Cruz. And just a couple hours ago, I was talking with one of our senior managers, um, a, a key individual within our business about tonight's meeting. And she said, I want to show you something. And she took out her phone and she pulled up Zillow. And she showed me that there is exactly one apartment listed on Zillow for rent in Santa Cruz. That is a two bedroom, like the two bedroom she currently occupies. That is less expensive than the apartment she currently occupies. One listing. And she said, this is the problem. There is not enough housing. If I want to move, I have one option to pay less than what I'm currently paying. And it just put it all in perspective for me. She said, you know, a lot of us who have housing, we don't realize just how challenging it is. We don't go to try to get the, the one listing and show up with a crowd of other people that are competing for that same spot. And I just want to encourage all of you not to limit the potential for the housing um, in this area that, that's being looked at. Um, you know, I, I, I have feelings about height. Um, I can see both sides of that. But where I think it's really important is that, that we not put a cap on what can be studied um, for the, the South of Laura, Laurel area, um, because there are just so many people in our community that, that need a place to live. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you, it. Mr. Davis. Thanks for calling in. Mr. Schoenfeld, good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Rafa Sonnenfeld, and because it's popular to uh, talk about our credentials uh, speaking this evening, uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz. I've lived, I'm a homeowner, and I've lived in Santa Cruz for over 30 years. Um, I just first off wanted to say that I support the staff recommendation for this evening to uh, continue with this project without changing the EIR. <clears throat> I think it's really important to 
uh, make sure that we are uh, uh, moving forward in the most expeditious and cost-effective manner, and that's that's proceeding without changing the EIR. Um, earlier this evening, someone mentioned that they uh, there would be com community outrage for tall buildings. You know, uh, I I support tall buildings. I, I I like having tall buildings in my community. It makes them a more walkable place to live, um, especially in the uh, south of Laurel area, um, where um, hopefully we'll be connecting uh, within walking distance to light rail at Depot Park. You know, that's uh, the the rail trail plan is a really popular thing that the a vast majority of folks in our county voted on. And if we want to support, uh, you know, trail or uh, rail projects, we're going to have to have people who use the, the rail projects. Um, and, and that means having having folks who live within walking distance to the rail corridor. Um, I can't imagine a better place to put more housing than downtown Santa Cruz. Um, uh, Rena is coming. Uh, lots of folks this evening have mentioned the over 3,700 units that we have to plan for. And, and it's, it's always complicated and challenging to agree on where we need to build housing in our community. But one place we can agree on is that it needs to be downtown. Uh, that's why I support as much housing as we can politically feasibly build downtown. Um, you know, someone else mentioned that, uh, that, you know, we're going back to this outrage thing. Uh, <laughs> I support tall buildings, but you know what I am outraged about? I'm outraged that at my high school reunion this summer, the majority of folks who can afford to remain in Santa Cruz who are my classmates are either doctors or lawyers or inherited their homes. We don't have uh, uh, housing for, for folks with working class jobs uh, like uh, construction workers or, or, or frankly, the folks who, who work downtown. And we need that in our community. Uh, you know, we need to have to reduce the commutes that, that our working class neighbors in Watsonville are, are having to come into the city. We can do that with light rail. We can also do that with more housing downtown. Um, that's that's really all, all I wanted to say tonight. Um, so I support the staff recommendation. It's the right thing to do. We don't need to change course at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush. We have one more, and they weren't unmuting themselves, so we'll try again. Okay. The phone number ending there there two ones. Oh, there, there we go. We can hear you. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's Jillian Greensight speaking. Um, I think the main um, topic is uh, whether to accept um, Mayor Keeley and uh, Council Member Newsom's amendment. So I just like to say straight up that I, I feel that Council should support that amendment. I think it was an attempt to respond to some of the concerns of the community at what is, uh, you know, to put it mildly, a dramatic difference in uh, heights in our town, uh, which is still a town in many ways. Uh, but since people have... So I would... Um, I urge you to support that. Uh, it's going in the right direction, although my preference would be three and four storeys, but we're not talking about that now, about preferences. I would like to just comment on um, some issues other people have brought up. Mr Ray's talked about... Uh, he, he was aware of many councils, I, I, maybe he just said councils, but councils who had voted against affordable housing and that you would set a new standard of voting for affordable housing. Well, I've been involved in local politics in Santa Cruz for 40 years and uh, I can't recall a council voting against affordable housing per se. So I think that's just um, a statement that is... Uh, inaccurate and sets up a sort of a, a, an attitude. Um, or maybe he could state which councils it has been. Um, I don't recall that. I think councils have really supported affordable housing. Next point is that there's a lot of talk, um, especially from union members, about jobs and housing, and none of us can be against such things, especially affordable housing. Um, but we can't base our planning on opinions and preferences. It has to be based on science. And there is research, research that you should know 
that is done by um, out of San Francisco, which says, if you're going to build this many, I'll just wait till the mayor is able to focus. Thank you. If you're going to build this many market rate houses, um, and 80 percent of this, whether it's of 1600 or 1800, is market rate, then that creates the need for a, a percentage of affordable units. So when people say, oh, this will provide housing for our local low-income people, you're creating a whole new surge of low-income service workers that are not going to be housed, or the current ones won't be housed. So you need to look at that. And lastly, since time's running out, the RENA numbers are driving a lot of this. There are cities that are suing over RENA numbers because they've been shown to be inaccurate. I suggest Santa Cruz become one of those cities so we're not beholden to these uh, inaccurate numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? Uh, no, please, no. Matters back before the council. I'll recognize Council Member Newsom for a motion. I make a motion to accept the report. I'll second that. Okay, we are going to uh, let me be sure that we're clear on this. So what you've just done is moved the second part, which is item 24.2, to accept the report and consider the information. We will then, following that, we will see if there is a motion on 24.1, but we will take up 24.2. There's a motion and a second. Is there a debate or discussion? You look like you want to tell me something, sir. I believe the intent was to move the recommended action for 24.1. Well, then that should have been the motion. Is that your motion? That's, motion. That's your motion. Okay, with the second? Yes, it is. Matter is back. The, uh, there's a motion and a second under debate and discussion. Mr. Newsom, would you like to mo open on your motion? You know, we've we've heard a uh, a good bit of uh, community feedback tonight. Uh, I, I will say that uh, you know I, I believe uh, the support of this plan that um, uh, that we are put forward is a, is a good faith effort uh, to try to uh, uh, address some of the concerns that are in the community, uh, while also uh, working towards building more housing, building for more uh, affordable housing. Thank you. Further debate or discussion, Ms. Collintar Johnson. Sammy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom for bringing this forward. And as Councilmember Newsom mentioned earlier, this was the direction we would, we would be heading. So I'm glad that you were bringing it here so we can memorialize it and find this middle ground that is more acceptable to some members of the community. Um, I also want to thank those who showed up here tonight and those who called um, to express um, your thoughts on, on how we should move forward as we do need to grow as a community. And I want to thank the staff. Um, there were some comments that were made tonight that uh, were bothersome to me um, towards staff. I think staff has done an incredible job of balancing what has been put before us by the state. Um, the RENA numbers didn't appear out of nowhere. They were, they've gone through a process. They were vetted. Um, the numbers may not be what we as a community are ready for or want to see, but that's what's before us. And I really want to commend staff for doing your best in um, bringing forward to us um, your recommendations of how we can achieve those numbers. Um, just a couple of other comments, um, and, and I will be supporting this motion. I think this is a good way forward. Um, we heard a lot of folks talk about um, climate change and what we're seeing in our recent floods. Um, this is climate response. We've heard some people speak to this. Best practices are to, are to create walkable communities, get folks out of cars, and, um, and have people live, work, and play in one area. This is a very specific climate response that has been implemented throughout the world and throughout this, this country. So, um, I see this as a step towards our community being responsible while maintaining the integrity of why we're all here, right? We're here because this is a unique and special community. We want to preserve that. Now, how we do it is it has to be, we have to consider um, very thoughtfully what's before us, 
um, we have to consider thoughtfully the direction that we are mandated to go, whether we're where we'd like to or not, um, and um, the steps that will get us there. So I'm, I'm kind of rambling. It's been a long night, but um, I believe what you have put forward and what you've brought as a middle ground is climate response, and it is providing housing. So I'll, I'll be happy to support this when we come to a vote. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to all of the members of the community who have uh, spoken to us tonight, written letters, been here for these conversations ongoing. Uh, I appreciate hearing from you all. And, um, and I heard a lot of things tonight that um, are, I've, are, I'm familiar with, uh, the arguments, and many of which I share. Um, I thought I would make a few comments about why I am supporting this, uh, given that I am uh, perhaps one of those council members who uh, Mr. Reyes might be referring to, <laughs> who votes against uh, uh, housing projects. I, um, I am a big supporter of affordable housing, and one of the things that I have uh, really tried to champion during my time, my six years on the council, is uh, to increase the uh, affordable housing stock as we uh, continue to bring, have projects come forward that are market rate projects. We can't stop those. Um, we have some say in the, how they are constituted, um, and less so with new state law has, has been mentioned. Um, but we have an opportunity here <laughs> to actually um, create a framework for including additional affordable housing units. Um, yes, 20% of uh, you know, a total number of units in this area is, uh, means that 80% are you know, unaffordable. Um, and that some of those affordable units aren't really affordable to very low income people. But the more that we can do to leverage those opportunities, um, I believe the better off we will be within the context, uh, this bigger market context, that does entail gentrification and displacement. So I'm really supportive of this, um, in large part because of the 20% uh, inclusionary goal and the idea that that is gonna be something that is, um, that is um, inclusive of the density bonus units. Um, you all have heard me talk about this uh, over and over and over. Um, this is a really big difference between the initial proposal um, that the council um, approved, I believe. Um, in that regard, if just for that alone, this is a huge difference. So, um, you know, and I, I won't say, repeat all of the concerns about, um, you know, the, the future and, you know, what kind of vision do we have? Uh, I think uh, Ms. Uh, Monheit said, um, you should plan your vision, right? It's not entirely my vision, but it's a vision that I can get on board with under the circumstances with all of the uh, competing needs, interests, and laws that have um, uh, created the, the current uh, realm of possibility. So um, thank you for letting me hold thank forth you. a bit. Thank you, council member. Let me ask if there are other comments by council members. A uh, couple of comments. Mr. Butler, uh, thank you for the staff report on this and for the previous consultations on this. Uh, I think what it does what your staff report does in conjunction with council member newsom and my agenda item is it elucidates the following concept which is that we are sort of kind of in control of our own destiny if we were sitting here 10 years ago we'd be having an entirely different conversation and i think where you stand depends on where you sit knowing the state legislature pretty well that where they sit, uh, they believe, rightly or wrongly, that some communities at some times, far too many for their liking, the legislature's liking and the governor's liking, have said no so many times that in their way of thinking, it forced the state's hand on reaching beyond what they had customarily reached to. California is a home rule state. It's less so today than it was three years ago, and it's less so three years ago than it was eight years before that. 
you're helping me with something, aren't you? Thank you. I appreciate that. Whatever it was you just did, I'm sure it was marvelous. Um, and, and I think that we can be fairly critical, in a fair manner, critical of what the state has done in certain regards. Of one of those is that in his, uh, in his first year as governor for the third time, Governor Brown was facing a very significant deficit in the state's general fund, billions and billions of dollars. And he realized at that moment that it was impossible for him to prosecute any other part of his agenda and the legislature's if all they were dealing with was the deficit and so go on a going forward basis. And so what the governor did, and, and, and I understand why, even though I don't like what he did, he swept off everything he possibly could that was impinging on the state's general fund. And part of that was to sweep $1.7 billion off the table of redevelopment funding available to local governments, in part to be able to build the affordable housing that both local communities wanted and the state of California wanted. When the state got into multi-billion dollar surpluses, we do know that there was no conversation in Sacramento about, remember when we took that 1.7 away from local governments? Maybe when we've got a 50, 60, 90 billion dollar surplus, maybe we ought to sweep that back off the table over to them. Or, you know what we'll do? We'll give them a successor agency in some form or fashion that'll do the same thing. They did neither of those things. And then, in my opinion, blamed the victim for not getting enough housing built. So I can have my issues with them, but where you stand depends on where you sit. From where they sit, that makes sense. And when I sat there, that makes sense. But that was 20 years ago, and that wasn't part of the conversation then. But when I sit here now, what occurs to me is that there's no less of an imperative to build housing in general and affordable housing particularly. And so it occurs to me that given how much authority has not been ceded to the state government, but how much authority has been taken by the state government, this was not something we asked them to do. We didn't ask them to take away our land use authorities or to turn us from a home rule state into a state government controlled land use state. We didn't ask for that. But we are where we are with this. And I do think that I believe that it was all very positively motivated when this council, the previous council actually, and this city government made the initial proposal on what to do south of Laurel. I think that was a very well motivated set of decisions. I think what we found out in the ensuing roughly 12 months is that that doesn't have purchase in the community. It's just not gonna fly in the community. It's too much, it's too tall, wasn't enough affordable housing and so on. Not because this council wanted it to be that way or the previous council wanted it to be that way, just how it turned out. And so I think that having a reset at this point, uh, I've said this to some of you privately, there's a consumer product and I have no idea what it is used for. It is called Head and Shoulders Shampoo. I have no <laughs> idea what this product is used for. But I do know that that company had the really smart idea of branding their product with the following slogan. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. I don't think that first impression worked very well out there in the community, frankly. I think we, contrary to that advertising slogan, do have a second chance to make a first impression and tonight this council action will help us do that. This is the beginning of a second start. It builds upon the good work that the city has already done. What they directed staff to do with regard to the environmental impact report and the California Environmental Quality Act. Very important first steps. But by doing quite a bit more than simply course correcting, by 
having a second chance at that first impression. I think we are much more likely to get where we want to go. Now, what you've done, Mr. Butler, I believe, is said without any ambiguity at all that the state is more in charge of what we do than they've ever been in the history of the state of California. And that if we want to have their goodwill in dealing with us going forward, we can say that what we want to have is 12 stories, 20% cumulatively affordable housing, and uh, some number of units. And you and I don't have the same idea, but I think you're right on what we should be studying in terms of the units. I would like it to be capped at 16. I understand your argument why it should be 18, and I'm going to vote of that. But I do think that this second opportunity, we were not going to have a third one or a fourth one to do this, but this is the first step in that resetting of what we are managing towards. And I think what you have done is given us a clear-eyed report that says if you reset this at 12 stories, 20% cumulatively, and 16 to 1,800 housing units, there are, in fact, ways to manage towards that. The shortest distance between two points may not be a straight line on this. In fact, it is unlikely to be a straight line on this for those three objectives. But there are paths to be able to get there, understanding that we are in a weakened position relative to the state. But we are not powerless here. We still have considerable land use authority. I want to thank the folks who testified here tonight in person, the folks who were on the phone, thank my colleagues for their good work on this. Mr. Butler, Mr. Huffaker, thank you both. You've been quite helpful. And Mr. Condotti, very helpful in figuring out the multiple threadings of multiple needles that got us here tonight. Thank you for that. Let me ask if there are further comments. I want to make very clear that we are voting on what I think we are voting on, sir. The motion that was made was uh, corrected to be item 24.1, correct, sir? That is correct, the recommended Very good. action is. So yes. we are going to have two actions tonight. We'll do this, then there's going to be a motion to accept the staff report on this, separate and apart. That is okay. correct. Seen and hear, hearing no further debate or discussion, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Um, Council Member Bruner has disqualified herself. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Chair will entertain a motion on the subsequent item on our agenda, item 24.2. I make a motion to accept 24.2. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion by Councilmember Newsom, second by Councilmember Watkins. Is there a debate or discussion? Seen and hearing none, excuse me, Just I'm a, sorry. Yes, a please. Comment. Thank you. Just want to make sure um, when we do the EIR and the 1800 units, will we do a comparison between the 1600 and 1800? Thank you, Councilmember Calentari Johnson. Yes, um, I would anticipate that we have an alternative that evaluates um, not to the same level of detail, but to a level of specificity that would allow us to understand the differences between the impact studied at 1,800 units versus those that we would see at 1,600. Thank you. Further comments? Further discussion? Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Council Member Bruner has recused herself. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. The motion carries, and so ordered. Let me ask if there's further business to come before the council this evening. Seeing and hearing none, motion to adjourn is in order. Ms. Golder moves. I'll see. Ms. Watkins seconds. To we, just, we, we just leave. Those in favor <laughs> signify by we saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Aye. This body stands in recess until January 17th, 2023. Damn gavel.
There we go.